Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Time, yeah, I'm, good, on, mate. I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch-long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and on. I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Ricky Connolly, welcome to the Nash Podcast, mate. How are you? I'm good. I'm cold, but I'm all right. Hey, you're very good. You've had a significant <laughs> capture, mate. Very, very significant yeah. in this weather. It's snowing out there. I know. It's mental. It's like winter has arrived in force, minus whatever it was this morning. Snow packing up this morning. So, yeah. But you've had a touch, mate. You've had a 40 pounder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, up at Ashbury Top Lake and uh, had one last week, 46 pounder. And then l- last night had a 42.12. Yeah. So, it's good for the time of year. I'll take that. What a boy. And he still managed to turn out one of the, if I know, not the best you know. dressed of all guests. Look at this. <laughs> you got a dress to impress. I thought I'd come to see you. I like this. Do you know what I mean? I've got to make a good impression. We're going out, out after, mate, we are. Apps throwing shapes. Essex. <laughs> watch out. <laughs> yeah, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Jenny, thank you so much for coming on, mate. You're no, synonymous with Fish On Tackle, mate. The, the tackle company, your work. But every time I go on Instagram... Your little face pops up, <laughs> normally a little beanie face. hat on, long hair, very carpy, with invariably some incredible fish, mate. You have caught some unbelievable carp, mate. Yeah, recently, the last few years have been, you know, prolific. <laughs> it's been good. Yeah. I've basically been Terry Earn of the tackle trade, mate. Oh, You've been smashing it, oh, haven't Tezza, you? I wish, I wish I would tell. But no, it's it's been, yeah. <sighs> mate, I've had time. That's the difference. I think that's the biggest the biggest key and I, I just go and fish hard fish relentless fish fish waters that you know have all the good ones in and i'm just there to try and catch them and yeah it's been good the last few years i can't i can't i can't fault really it's been amazing you do well mate you said their time that being a key thing yeah very much and you hear it all the time i'm guilty of saying it myself when you work in the trade whatever guys that might take up invariably what happens is you lose the time to actually go fishing for yourself. Yeah, you absolutely. seem to have struck that balance pretty well in recent years. Yeah, right? but I didn't initially. So, you know, if you're talking about shop life, you know, my shop, the doors opened 2010, so we're coming up to our, you know, 12th, 13th year or whatever. Um, and initially, yeah, mate, I didn't have no time at the beginning, like mm. no time. So, but I knew that. I knew that was coming, and if you want something, then you've got a you know, have the sacrifices of giving up what I love doing, which is fishing and, and concentrate on the matters in hand, which was ultimately set up a shop and, and try and make it as su- successful as possible. So fishing went on the back burner, mate. So, but now it's, you know, all those years on, it's taken a long time, mate, you know, and yeah. we've, we've moved in that. So you start to get a bit of time again and then um, we moved to a much bigger place all of a sudden had less time. But then now I've got a really nice balance. I've got some good staff and, yeah, you know, I think if, if you look back, the reasons for me is why why did I open a shop in fishing? Because I love fishing, right, and I'm good at selling. So it's sort of like a nice combination, but ultimately don't lose, you know, that fishing vibe because that's what I love doing. If I didn't fish, I'd be very miserable, and especially being surrounded by fishermen every single day. Yeah. If I didn't go, yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't be good. So now I've got that balance where – I got plenty of time and, and during the week I, I fish, you know, two nights every week and, and have a balance and have the weekends with the missus at home, you know, so it's a nice balance, mate. Nice, mate. Before we go into the sort of chapters of shop life, because it's an incredible story on its own right, mm. you're starting, you're fishing, you were always sort of synonymous with around Kent, Essexy Way, were you or not? Only Kent. Yeah, Only Kent. Only Kent, yeah. Born and bred in Kent. Um, and, you know, I just grew up fishing the club waters, um, six years old, 
you know, in fact, six, six years old, my dad brought me my first rod, which was a metal, I think it was from Woolworths probably, like this metal rod with string like as line on this little plastic grill and we went to this little pond, which had, I can remember it, had all of uh, lilies everywhere and, you know, me and my brother just caused an absolute carnage um, running around the lakes, sort of pestering other anglers. But um, I do remember a guy, I, I, yeah, this this guy, he sort of had this long sort of dark curly. I remember it as if it was yesterday. He had long sort of dark curly hair. He was wearing like an old school army DPM coat and he caught a carp. I don't know how big it was, but it was. A, I remember it was a common, probably five or six pounds. And I was just like, yeah, I want to catch one of them, Dad. So then, you know, I think a week later, my dad brought me my first proper fishing rod, which was one of those bright lime green sort of uh, yes. Shakespeare jobbies, you know, I think rod and reel for like a tenner or whatever it was back in the day. But that, that was, that's where it all started. And Gudgeon was the first fish I caught. Um, and I, I remember that as well. It's meant, wasn't it? Like there's loads of things I can't remember, which I should remember. Yeah. And then there's things that like that. I, I remember fishing and catching 26 Gudgeon in a day and it was like the best day ever. And, um, it's mad, isn't it, when you think, because there's so many parallel similarities to, like, everybody's story as well. But yeah. I'm the same, mate. Very, like, there's certain things I definitely don't remember, but there's certain prominent events that are, like... Yeah, them, them things, like, it's it's it's, it's etched, it, it sort of paves the way, doesn't it? That yeah. little did my dad know or I know, but that was the start of, of what it is now. You know, just taking me there, going fishing on the float and just catching those gudgeon. Gudgeon are one of the best fish. They're so cool, aren't they? And, uh, yeah, that that was it. That was it, literally, like, from then on, everything lived, breathed fishing, you know. Where was that first sort of, if you like, proper carp fishing water for you, mate? Were you um, preceded all the sort of going into it, sort of buying your proper setup, and then you get to that point where carp fishing becomes a little bit more sort of serious and encompassing, and yeah. there is that water, isn't there, for everyone where it's like... Funny enough, it's it? probably the same lake. I mean, there was, on that plate, it was, it was Paddockwood Angling Club. They had a complex called Gedges. Um, <laughs> there was this fish. Me and my brother used to go up there um, all the time in the in the close season. And um, opposite where we lived, there was a post office. And Jack, the old boy in there, used to give us his stale loaves of bread. So we would load up our rucksacks, jump on our mountain bikes, ride up up to the lake. We used to go and spend all our time in the close season just feeding the carp. And this one time, we saw this carp, which was absolutely like. It dwarfed everything. So we called it the mother. <laughs> the mother. It was like this massive sort of mirror, like mental. Car. It was massive, right? And it was, and that then, that was like, oh, mate, how old was I? Probably 11, 12. And he was a year or two older. And that's when it sort of started. And, and it was from then on, it was like, I want to catch the mother. I need to catch the mother. And the funniest thing ever, it was, um, this lake, Lake Three at, at Gedges, and uh, the lake was sort of split into two. I had like a little bridge that separated it. And um, my brother was fishing. We used to call it the pond section. And I was fishing a lake one further down, and he was fishing the pond section. Anyway, he said he's, he's going to go for a walk like you do. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll sit on your rods. As soon as he walked off, you know, the rods smack round to the left. The old optonics just gone whack, like bent over. And I'm playing this carp on his on his little Mitchell reels and rods and. Pops up, it was the mother. Oh. I was like, oh, my God. So I've netted it, and uh, my brother's come back, and I'm like, I had it in a, it's funny enough, an old, old natty carp sack. I'd, I said, mate, I've, I've got the mother, I've got the mother. <laughs> yeah, and he was like, well, he was gutted. He was gutted. Livid, mate. He was, he was so gutted. And um, the picture is amazing, because I'm there, I've got, like, my Puma tracksuit on, with, holding this, this mirror, which was 13 pounds, four ounces, you which mate. was... Massive, mate. It was massive. You know, if if you if you think of all the other carp at the time, like on the back of my photos, you know, I've caught an eight pounder, a six pounder, and all that sort of stuff. And then to catch something of thirteen pounds, it was, and it was the lake record. <laughs> it was the biggest fish in the yes. lake. Oh, it was mega man. Poached off his rod, yeah. mate. But the funniest thing was, right? It was crazy. So my brother come around. I don't know why, but we put, put the fish. I think I went to get my brother. But I put the fish back in the sack. So then maybe I've walked around with my brother or I've, or I've gone to find him. I can't remember. But someone else came up because it was such a prestigious fish. Took the I didn't even know this until like later on. Took the fish out and I had photos with it. Shut up. And then put it back in the sack. And yeah, and then What's some randomer? I knew the geezer, yeah, but he 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 come round. I didn't I didn't know, but he had photos of that carp. 
Oh my! The fish God. I just caught on my brother's rod. Yeah. Can like, you imagine? But that is a moment when you've caught them, even if it is slightly dubious, and you've completely taxed. <laughs> oh yeah, rod. completely. But yeah. you are like that, in your I was like, oh, mate, back. I was like eleven or twelve. I'd, I'd done the lap of honour, walking. Around. <laughs> All right, mate, caught anything? Well, I've just caught the mother. So how are you getting on? <laughs> <laughs> But I ended up catching loads, man. I, you know, it's one of the, me and my mates used to be like loads of, me and my pals used to go up there and I, I caught it so many times. I think I had it like, I don't know, every year I think I caught it for like three years. Oh, and it was like that. another lake record. I think it, like, it was mental. I think I had it just under 19 pound in the end. And um, however many years later, like it was still spoke about people would come to my shop and go, yeah, mate, you caught the mother last weekend. No. Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah, me and my brother named that. Is she still going, the mother? No, bless. She died. Oh, what Bless her. But yeah, it was a mega cut, like, you know, and then we had the teenager. Like, you had all these others that we sort of named. The one that's not slightly as big, you know, we just started naming carp. I've, I've named loads of carp. But yeah, that was like, that was, that was them, mate. And then from there, so that was when I, I, you know, I first got the taste of carp fishing because I saw that carp and I wanted to catch that carp. And then we fished back to the place where I caught the gudgeon. We had, you know, the proper setups there and I had my microns and... Yeah, was that a bit, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, the yeah, I saved up at 13. I saved up all my paper and money for a year and brought a set of armor lights. Oh. Um, yeah, mate, I've still got them. I had them all refurbed a couple oh. of years ago. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful rods. Um my dad were Regal X bait runners. You know, I had, yeah, I had, I had solar satellite system. Can you remember them? Oh my God, mate. But They're yeah, all, all birthday money, Christmas money was spent on that. And uh, yeah, I was fishing that lake. And you know, there's, it's, it's funny. My mate now owns that place and there's carp that I was catching when I was 13, 14, which I'm, I've, I've caught this year. It's crazy. And you know, they're 30, 40 year old carp. So that, that was, that was the start of it. And then probably jumping into proper serious carp fishing is when I fished, um, I got a ticket on the ballast pit. I don't know if you've heard of the ballast pit, but it's, it's very renowned in Kent. And that had some like proper old mega, I think Jesus of Nazareth stocked these carp <laughs> himself. They're proper fish, you know, proper. And uh, I lied about, about my age. You have to be 16. And I was 16 that year in July. But at the start of the season, like 16, I was still 15. So I think I lied and... Uh, my brother had fished it. I used to go and visit my brother like, on, the, on a mountain bike, go and see him. Okay. And he caught some weapons like out of there, like meant like, you know, old leany, like wow. oh, just mega carp. And um, it, it was really like daunting and intimidating, you know, all the people on there, like diehard anglers that, you know, and then you got this little ginger dude rocks up with his little high squeaky voice, you know, giving it the big one. But um yeah, it was mental. And there was the one fish in there, which was the ultimate carp, which my brother and everyone wanted to catch. It was the fish. It was a fish called pie eye, which was a 30 pound common. Oh. Yeah. Outrageous, mate. Like pucker. Pie pucker. eye. Pie eye. Had a black eye. Had a black eye. One eye was black. It was just a beautiful, if you, you know, imagine an old English common, chestnutty, dark browny, like, oh, just yeah. mega. And um, yeah, anyway, so... Uh, this lake, it's mental now to think of, of how we used to fish back then, but the lake was probably five acres, yeah, long, narrow, 60 yards to the far side. But now you just fish one side, you cast to the other. But then, it was, you know, it was, it was a, like I say, it was like a circuit, a Kent circuit water. And, um, what, the pegs the other side then? Yeah, the pegs the other side. Oh. And, and literally every single swim. So there'd be matey there, I'm here, matey there, my brother's there, yeah. matey there. And that's how it was. So, yeah, I, I didn't have a clue. And it was, like, covered in lilies, covered in lilies. It's beautiful lake, like, really, really snaggy, big bushes, deep margins, nice. And uh, I remember being in the car park. We'd done sort of, like, a draw or whatever. And I didn't I literally didn't have no clue. So my brother was, like, sort of guiding me. He's like, yeah, just go in there and drop them down there. I was like, yeah, all right. And um, at the time, like I say, because I lived and breathed it, I, I contacted Lockie at Solar. No. And I was like... I want some bait, but I'm like 15. I haven't got any money. And um, I remember he sent me this base mix, like 10 kilo base mix. He, he put, dear student Grant, I hope this helps you out or something. So oh. I made this bait in the garden, uh, solar squid and octopus, and uh, added Scopex to it back in the day. Overpowered it with Scopex. Yeah, like it. <laughs> it's savage. But, mate, wherever I took it, it, it just destroyed places. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I put that on, just had like a little, on my little owner hook and my little fluorocarbon hook link, load it in the edge, chuck some bait around it. And then in the morning, um, 
I had a bite, play in this car, proper agging me, up and down the margin, beasting me. Of course, that's a good common. I'm like, shit, you know, that's a really good common. And then, uh, yeah, netted it. And then I looked at his eye and I was like, oh, his eye's black. And I'm like, no way. Did you give it the shout? Paya! Oh, no, I, I went up to my brother and I was just like, and he was still in bed or whatever. And I was just like, um, has Pi Eye got a black eye? And he's like, why? Because he's never caught it and everyone wanted to catch it. <laughs> and I was like, mate, I've got this common, oh, it's got a black eye. And he's like, fuck it, <laughs> rough, 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 you know. And then, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really awkward because it backed onto like a railway line. So you sort of got these really steep sort of steps with a high bank and you've got literally like no room, like probably the width of that table yeah, of bank, like, yeah. yeah. So then you walk back down into the swim and he looked in the net and he was like, fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like, I love that. Yeah, and then a couple of people that um, were like my brother's mates, they came round. He's like, fucking ginger bollocks and all this stuff. And I'm like, what? And it, yeah, mate, it's 31 5. I was like, that mega, I was that's like, so funny, mate. 15, and it just blew me away, this like ridiculous car. <laughs> what was your biggest car before that? Oh, mate. Um, but I don't know, probably 22, 23 pound. From next door, there was a lake next door, Barden Park Lake. They, yeah. they, I, they, that done the Kent record years yeah. and years ago. Um, but I probably had them to sort of like low twenties. I can't even. That's the thing. I can't remember that. Yeah. I, I can't remember my first twenty. But I can remember my first fish being a gudgeon. You know. But I'd been to France the year before, and I'd, I'd caught carp to twenty nine pound, which was a monster. So yeah, I absolutely like just smashed oh, it out yeah, of the park. Mate, that's yeah. unreal. I was a nice carp. Yeah, then I caught another, I caught another, like, it's hard. It's a really tricky lake. Like people do like all season for a few fish and I caught three that trip or f- maybe four, a 21 common, a one called Black Spot, a 23 mirror, which I then caught many years later out the river on a floater. Like, yeah, just, what? yeah, we mental. flooded out and you caught it out. Yeah, the, the lake, that, the, they got the medway. So you got like the ballast yeah, yeah. bit one side, then the other side you got barred in, then you got the medway right next to it. Yeah, I know barred then. Yeah, so when it floods, it floods. Yeah. And and all of that pie I got out, there's a fish called the Big Leany, Little Leany. They got out. Um, yeah, lo- loads of real good carp got out. And I think the Leany got caught in Maidstone, which is miles away. That Some of them literally, what's up until a couple of years ago, one of them died and it was over 60 years old. Wow. Yeah, an old common called Small Tail, which went over 30 pounds and it ended up looking like a banana, bless it. But yeah, like. There are old, proper Kent history fish. Geographically, mate, Kent as well. Like that was the. If you're going to be into your carp fishing, mate, that's pretty much where. Yeah, you want I to know, be. and and it's mental because obviously you got like the Larkfield complex and all that. I mean, I I didn't go on the Larkfield. I fished Alders and Brooklands and places like that. Yeah. But I I didn't go on to to Larky Railway. My friends did, um, but I I never I never went over there and. and I, I used to work near there, so I had all of those customers that would come down who's been fishing the railway, you know, back in the day with the Kent Carp and, and whatever else, and mm. I never went over there. And I'm, I'm gutted. I sort of, it's, it is a regret, a lot of regrets of not fishing up in the valley in my earlier days. But Yeah, I don't know, mate. It is what it is. You carve your sort of own Yeah, path, it is what it you? is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I had fun where I was, and then, you know, life sort of changes and you do different things for a while, and... You know, I started the business, so maybe you know, I, I didn't have time. Let's, let's put it like that. I didn't have time. Your your personality, right? The conversations we've had, mate, incredibly funny, incredibly articulate, very charismatic, very busy, Thank you. mate. Very busy <laughs> though. Do you know what I mean? Like, probably not synonymous in a sort of a typical way of what I would say would be sort of a big carp angler in terms of lots of time, lots of patience. Do you know what I mean? It's very, you're quite like, very energetic, isn't you? You're always yeah. quite, you know what I mean? For you, why do you think carp fishing resonated with it? Why do you think it was so sort of, I don't know, so I don't, captivating? I don't know. I, I question that now mm. until I get that bite and then I'm playing an absolute enormous and then I've, I've realised that's why I do it. I think, I think to me now, certainly now, it's the whole working out factor. Like, yeah, I love that. And that's what captivates me. The whole, you know, as you know, I fish a lot of different waters and they demand different skills or or different types of angling. And I love that. Like, you know, whether you're fishing right in the edge watching them and and you're getting done, so you're changing your rigs and then you catch them, you're like, come on. Do you know what I mean? That's that's what I buzz off. Or if I'm fishing out in the pond free on a spot, you know, it's working that out. And that's why I like, like, carp are cool. Like, Mm. you know, the, the... 
they're, they're good fish to angle for and, and they're all different. Like you can, you know, some like loads of bait, some don't. And I, I, that's what I like. That's what the captivating thing for me is just trying to work it out. And since an early age, like the mu- going back to the mother, yeah, the mother was always in the edge, like always in the edge. You'd never catch the mother out in the pond. So if you wanted to catch it, and I used to say to my pals after like the fifth time or whatever I caught it, like just fish like a few inches from the edge. And, and that was like the working out of how to catch that fish. And, and, you know, you used to catch it all the time. Like, you know, like even going to the extent then of 13, like covering your lead up with like clay, you know, and just like proper camouflage because it would come in right into the shallows. And, I used, you know, that that's that's the fun part to me. And I think that's why I love the carp fishing, you know. That makes sense. In terms of like your angling, and we're going to talk about different chapters, but it has been relatively quite flitty. It's not been about catching the biggest fish. It's been no. going on, yeah. catching move on to another one. Yeah. And also, in amongst that, mate, you've done some mega fishing and, and captures of other species as well, haven't you? You still like your predator fishing, you still like all that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the being in the industry, you know, when you're surrounded by angling and, and stuff like that, I think it's very easy to burn yourself out. Mm. And um, I, I don't want to burn myself out. Like, you know, I've had times where I've, I've had to learn this, by the way. Like, I have been burnt out by carp fishing, when I was younger, because I used to go all the time. But then you start fishing for other things and you realise, like, there's more to angling than, say, carp fishing. And you can start doing mental things like, you know, I love perch fishing, I love pike fishing. I've just just got a decent barbel ticket recently, so that's what I'm going to do sort of, um, you know, Christmas and January near me. So just like a learning another skill set, you know. It's just you've got to keep your mind active and motivated. And, it, and if it means that, you know, carp fish in a few different waters throughout the year because they're like I say they're different so you've you're challenging yourself differently fishing in the edge fishing out in the pond and then you know chucking in the odd predator trip here and there or the odd barbel trip and stuff like that it's, it's it keeps that buzz going you have to do that when, you, when you're surrounded by it you know when you're surrounded by it and it's constant you have to keep like that fire burning and it is literally like I'm more passionate now than I've ever been. And that's the truth of it. Considering I used to scribble on my, all my, you know, school books, carp this and drawings of pike that how I was, I was so like enveloped in this like fishing world. And now I'm, I'm probably more so. You know? How was school, mate? What was school like with all that? Was it, did you talk about it? Do you have like fishing mates at school? Yeah. Do you know what? Like, I mean, it, it's different now. We get a lot of kids that come into school now and it's like, he's the only one of the year yeah, that yeah, goes yeah, fishing. Yeah. And it's sad. It really is sad because they miss out so much, not just fishing, but being outside nature and all that. Um, but at my school, you know, there was probably a, you know, a good group of us that would go fishing and we would take over the lakes, you know. And some of my, my closest mates still today, we used to go fishing, you know, all the time as kids, like mm. all the time. So it was cool. I, you know, I was fish boy when I was the. Fish boy. Uh, yeah, I just, yeah. <laughs> I just, you had some right Kent names, didn't you? Pie Eye, the mother, mate. Yeah. Brilliant. I yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't actually called Fish Boy, but everyone knew that I was just obsessed with fish, man. Because everything, you know, I, I based, you know, when I went to college, I, I, I based, I was doing a magazine. I studied design and I, and I, I done a magazine thing around a fishing mag. I designed my own fishing mag and, and for CDT at school. Yes. My, yes. My, my project, I, I, built a chair like my own fishing chair and it was mental I, I built this chair it was mega dpm like oh really yeah big reclining chair unique leg system no one's done it i'm waiting i, I painted it if they, they try i'll do them but um i remember i was fishing gedges and some some kid was using my chair he, he, he found it in the cdt class and he took it down the lake and he was sat on my chair that i built for my cdt course joking. yeah you mental. should have had that chair, mate. What should have had it. It was a throne. It was a, it was <laughs> not a, a chair, mate. It was massive. It was like way, way too big for me. <laughs> but yeah, it was a good chair. What about what about that period of life where and it is classical? You sort of discover going out, girls, all that sort of stuff. Was it always consistent in your life, carp fishing, or did it wane over that period of time? Yeah, every, it wanes for everyone, doesn't it? You find something more interesting. And then that soon gets boring because they just nag at you all the time and stuff. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. But um, no, I saw it's, it's always, I think with relationships, it has been always like a balance. Like I, I hear it a lot where people meet someone and they stop fishing. Yeah. 
And then all of a sudden they, they're comfortable and then they want to start going fishing again. And, and, and the other half might be like, oh, hold on a minute, when we got together, you didn't fish two nights a week or whatever. So I've always sort of maintained that um, that's what I do. You know, like yeah. I, I, I go fishing and it's sort of, I have to go for my own sort of well being. I have to, I have to be outside. I have to sleep outside and do stuff. It makes me feel so much better in myself and be surrounded by wildlife and nature. It's such a thing that, you know, I've, I've sort of installed that in, in, in my life. So, but yeah, and initially, yeah, when I was 18, 19 and, and I'm driving and I'm going out and, and then, um, probably in my mid twenties, I, I had a sort of a bit of a, it was like binge culture days, wasn't it? Oh the yeah. Binge culture, you know? So, um, that period, I, I, I come back from traveling a couple of times and that was a uh, going out all the time. I'd still slot in trips, but I wasn't as, as full bore as I had been or, or am since. But So you had that period, it's what, like 18 to about 20? No, probably like, probably like 18 to, to 21. Well, I was still fishing, not, not, you know, um, and then 22 to sort of 24, I traveled a lot. And then I sort of got involved in that, like I say, the, the drinking. So sort of segments really. And then that's, I soon sort of burnt, I realized that whatever I was earning every week, I was just like pissing it up the wall and yeah. waking up under cars and things like that. You know, all the, all the raucous carnage stuff, like you've got yeah. nothing to show for it other than a hangover, but I can't even remember any of it really. Cause I was so like out of it all the time. But, um, yeah, and then yeah, then I just got back into it, but sort of fishing locally and, and going abroad quite a lot as well. So. That that period, and it's, it's another similarity that both you, both me and you have got in terms of going out traveling during that time that you were traveling, and we're talking about your classic sort of for you like backpacking and, and, yeah. and Canada, Southeast Asia, and everybody. but you fished during that time like I did as well, didn't you? Yeah, you were absolutely. Out yeah, yeah. The main reason I went to Canada was to fish. So started in the states, started in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, which was quick, wicked, like the A1A, you know, vanilla rice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A1A, pizza. That's, that's where we stayed, right on that road. And, and it had a wicked beach. It was a wicked beach. It actually turns out it was a gay beach. There were the biggest gay beach in that area. <laughs> so we was going down there at night and just kind of like catching snapper and whatever, like hooking up on sharks and just losing them and just getting chatted up every five minutes. Well, you just thought people were friendly. Yeah, I got a really nice ride here, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, yeah, can I look at your ride? <laughs> I'm like, man, mental. But um, yeah, so then sort of travelled up in like up, up, up the east side of the States and then caught a train from New York into Montreal. And um, yeah, just got a bus, got a bus to the river. Um, like, and how long it took? It was, it was, I think two buses stop Jeez. here, change there. Got to the river and just walked and walked and walked and and found this massive flyover. And next to the flyover was like this um, sort of big pipe, loads of water just coming out of it. And just sort of peered over and there was about a gazillion carp. I was like, oh my God. Oh, here we go. Yeah, it's mental, mate. So yeah, went back to the hostel, you know, and the next morning went to the supermarket, bought like a couple of bags of corn or whatever. And just freelining corn, mate, catching fish up to 30 pounds. Just watching them take it, yeah. And just... I've got a record of it. It was so good, mate. Like the fishing was epic. And um, there was this one absolute Enormadon common, bigger than everything. Bear in mind, we caught them up to 30 pound. Um, I had all the kit with me. So I had at that time. Did you have with you? Yeah, I was going to say, if you travel. Yeah, so I just, as I was leaving, it was perfect timing. Fox brought out this sort of travel range of rods. Tourists, they were called. Right. So it was like a 12 foot, six piece carp rod. Um, two and three quarter test curve. I had like a, Shimano Airlex loaded up with braid, yeah. you know, Delkin, bank stick. I had a salmon net, Sharps of Aberdeen done a, shab, a salmon a net. salmon yeah, net? Yeah, because that's the biggest net I could get that could fold down. It's different now. Oh, yeah, cool. You've got everything now. But then, you know, you had to make do. And I just had a little pouch with like loads of random bits, you know, bit for sea fishing, bit for course yeah. fishing. Yeah. And just had to make do with that. And um, yeah, anyway, so we're free lining, catching loads. And I kept seeing this common man. It was it was just ginormous. What are you saying, forty pound? Bigger. What? It was massive. It was like probably fifty pound. It was so big. It was like twice. It was probably not. It was probably like thirty nine yeah. pound, but about eight <laughs> foot long. But it was like it was just so so big. But I remember, you know, we those fish had never been caught, right? So we're just there and we're just catching them, just catching them. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the shoal's gone down from like fifty to thirty. I think like the first day we might have caught. I was with my mate Rich. 
you know, I might have caught 10 each and then the next day you kept eight each and the next day you kept seven. And, and we was there for like... Binning them out. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> and I kept seeing this common, kept seeing it. Anyway, so we fished up about 30 yards because they were getting pummeled from that pipe. So <laughs> the fish sort of moved. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we fished about 30 yards up and it's, the bank's quite high and I could just see this common all the time, mate. It was so big, man. Anyway, we just sat there, and I'm only fishing like 10 yards out, really shallow. Yeah. And before the buzzer, like, bleeped, I just heard this massive explosion, this massive eruption. I was like, that's it. Just gone. I could hear my buzzer just, like, screaming. And my mate picked up, um, we had like a, I say it's a handy cam. It was about this big back in those days, like this, this video thing. And he's filming me. And I've just hooked this thing, and it's just gone out into the flow. And I could just see it, and it's just up. It's dorsals up, it's tail. Oh, yeah. Mate, it was four foot long. It was massive, this thing. And it was just going. And I was like, and my mates feel I've watched it loads, you know. It's just like um, Rick's hooked onto a massive cart. <laughs> yeah, he's following it down the river. And then it cuts and he's like, oh, no, he's lost it. And I'm just like. Stood oh, there, with, no. you know. I should have just stayed in that swim and just tried to get its kite round, but I just followed, and it was just in that flow, mate. And it was just going and going. It, it, it was going to the Atlantic, I think. It was just on a mission. Wait, what a video that is, mate! I know it's cool. I, I should watch them really because we we then left there um, in in Montreal, and basically I was googling areas, and Cornwall kept coming up. I don't know if you know Cornwall or Long Sioux, no. that sort of area. Anyway, that was the sort of areas that I found where, like, Canada carping and all that, they were all Oh, okay, placed. yeah, yeah. So um, I literally caught a train to as close as I could, which was Cornwall, um, got in a taxi, and, and I just said, just take me to the river. And the guy's like, where? And I said, I'll, I'll tell you. And so we drove to, like, Long Sioux, and there's, like, it's called, like, the Bay of Islands, I think. And it's like a load of islands in a, in a row connected by bridges. Like, the river's, like, a mile wide, isn't it? It's yeah. massive, the St. Lawrence. So, yeah, we went out on this on this island and I, he said, whereabouts? I was like, just keep driving. I, I don't know where, but just keep driving. Mate, we got to the last island, turned the corner, and I see a common about 300 yards. <laughs> no just go, out. I'm here. Psh! I went, that'll do. And, um, mate, literally paid the guy and then um, just blasted out a single <laughs> as long as I could. Half an hour. No. Yeah, like this 15-pound common or whatever. Go on. But it was, it was mega. It was it was mega fishing. We ended up sort of plotting up in this swim, me and my mate. We had the smallest tent, like went to a camping shop, brought yeah, this tent. Classic. We, had, we had to, I mean, mate, I'm like barely five foot seven and three quarters, probably nearer five foot six and three quarters, but really, and we were laying in this tent and my head was pushing out one end, my feet were pushing out the other. Me and my mate were top and tailing. And um, I remember I, I rung my mum and said, look, just letting you know, I've just got to, um, this place, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, wow, I can see a raccoon. Oh, they're really cute. And all these raccoons are bowling about. Come on, mate. Like that late that night, they, me and my mate are in this tent and they're scratching at the bivy trying to get our oh, food. No. I was like, fuck off. Like, mental. Well, no, well, bears, mate, are the one, isn't they? You want a blinking bear bowl. Yeah, I don't think there's right? any bears on that island, Good but job, the raccoons like done our head in. But yeah, anyway, as, as sort of luck would have it, um, uh, randomly, like, happens. It's so bizarre, isn't it, when you're, on holiday, you bump into someone you know, and, and I've had it all over the world, like the most f- mental places. Oh, mate, how are you doing? Um, this guy, uh, Cliff, who works for Crafty Catcher. Right. He used to go to Canada a lot, and he's just, he's, he's fishing with Canadian carping, and he's just gone for a drive, and he's walking towards me, and I'm like, Cliff? He's like, Ricky? I'm like, how are you doing? At the time, he was with Ocean Fresh. I don't know if you can remember oh Ocean God, Fresh. Yeah. And, um, Anyway, yeah, so we, we had a rattle. I said, mate, all, all I've got, we've got no bait. So we're just fishing singles. We're catching carp, but fishing singles. I said, um, you know, c- can you help us out? And he, he gave me two tubs of yellow pop-ups, um, got us some maize. Oh, and, um, mate. mate, in the end, it was, just, it was just jokes fishing. So it was just like chucking the maize in the water, letting it soak for a couple of days. Like we, we were just camped out, like having the best life barbecues. And then um, going to the, the guys, because there's like people with massive RVs, like this huge, yeah, like, yeah. And just chilling with them and having beers and, and uh, borrowing their kayaks, going out into the river, dumping a load of maize and then just casting. Mate, we caught like... That's the dream, mate. So many, so many carp. This this one time, there's this... When we used to leave, we used to go to this shop a couple of miles up the road to get our supplies and that. And all the people would look after our kit. It was cool. We'd walk over this bridge and every time we walked over this bridge, we saw some mega fish. They're just going in and out of the bridge. Yeah, yeah. So me and my mate went there 
for the day. And I, I never again, and another one of those memories you never forget. I had 28 carp in a day. And um, my, <laughs> we had, I had a 37 pound common and my mate had a, oh. he had a 35 at the time. We both bundled him into my salmon net, broke that. I had something, I don't know, like five or six thirties that day or something. It was just crazy. Yeah, that's epic. That crazy, is. crazy fishing. And then, yeah, literally, so from eight till six, I had all those fish, reeled in, go back to the swim, cast out. I had a 30 pounder on the drop. Literally cast on out. On the drop. On the drop. And I'm feeling it. I'm like, oh, this is still going. Oh, yeah, I'm in. And then just like a 30 pound common beach in it. We caught loads, man. It just got better and better. Any mirrors? Mate, two mirrors. Oh, my God. Two mirrors. So that week, so I, I've got a thing. I had 101 carp that week and there was two mirrors in it. The most beautiful looking. They are rare, mate, on that system, Really rare. They? Really rare. Yeah, funny that one was on the last morning before we packed up. But it was just, it, mate, it was... It was unbelievable fishing. The people that are around you, because they don't know carp fishing, they're all bass fishing. And there was this woman, she was a, a, a bus driver for the school. I think she's a bit of an, in fact, I know she's a bit of an alky. Because she, she used to come and visit us. We used to see these headlights, like, coming over the hill, go, oh, I can't remember her name. It's like, Here she comes, here she comes. She's like, like narrowly miss your, your tent. Ooh. Hey, boys, how are you getting on? And I'm just like, yeah. And anyway, we... She sort of befriended her. She used to get us supplies and stuff like that. And um, she used to love bass fishing. She used to love it. And um, I said, I'll set you up a carp rod. So I gave it like, gave me a bass rod and I put like a hair rig on it and like an inline lead. And I said, just cast it out there somewhere. And we just catapulted some maize over it. And she had like a 28 pounder, but she's like shit herself because she was like, She's like, oh my god, man! Like this is outrageous. <laughs> but she, um, quality, she man. was a legend, mate. One night, this storm came in, and it was mental, mental storm. So, bearing in mind, like me and my mate are in this tent, um, yeah, that like narrow, and we are getting drenched. All the in the in the, the tent probably had a hydrostatic head of a paper bag. You know, it, it was shocking, and all the water was coming in. Again, saw the headlights coming over the hills and, and she's like, hey guys, come and, come and jump in my caravan. But it was like, yeah, all right. <laughs> Go to this caravan. i never forget it, right? We pulled up this caravan. I went, is that it? Like, it was tiny. Oh, mate. I think our tent was bigger. My mate's like, shut up. Anyway, she's like, I'll, I'll cook you a roast chicken. I was like, all right, sweet. So we went in this thing, like, out of the elements. She's cooked us this roast dinner, which is mega. And then I woke <laughs> I'm up, me and my mate sort of like getting out to top and tail on like this sofa and she had this bed and I woke up at like whatever time and she's pissing into a saucepan. Shut up. And she just looked at me and she went, sounds of the summer. And she just carried on being. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I was like, oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> sounds of the summer. Just like drrr, drilling into this saucepan, mate. Oh, mate, what has gone? That is, r- yeah. that is random beyond, isn't it? Yeah, mate, yeah. So yeah, the fishing, like with backpacking, it was always going to be a thing. So <laughs> Oh, oh dumb me, mate. That yeah, so then I left cool. there and then we ended up going to New Zealand. I didn't fish in New Zealand because it was the winter. I went there for snowboarding. So we went to like Queenstown and, and sort of done some snowboarding for a month or whatever. What a place that is, mate. Mental party place, yeah. Good good times, good times. And then from there, went over to Oz. <sighs> spent like eight or nine months in Oz and, and caught some, yeah, weaponry, sharks and trevally and, you know, from barra? the East Coast. Did you catch a barra? Fished for barra up in Cape Trib, but never caught one. <laughs> Never caught one. Mega, mate. Yeah, that I, I, it's, it's one of them that's on my bucket list. There's a few that I'd really like to catch and I would love to have a go for Get some. back there, boy. Yeah, a big if they man. allow me. Yeah. I'll let you back, mate. Yeah. I'll let you back. Well, that woman from the US will get you mate, in, mate, in, yeah. a, in a bush. God, I bet she's dead now. <laughs> no, she'll still be going. <laughs> still pissing in sauce. She'll be like a well-known murder case, won't it? Oh, God. The school bus lady. Yeah. Infamous. Yeah. Mate, she was so, honestly, she was drunk all the time. I used to, be petrified for her kids that she's to ferry about. <laughs> <laughs> what a trip, mate. Oh. But then that that basically, your your sort of schooling was all geared around design. It was all geared around art. How did that, in amongst this period of travelling, then go into sort of the tackle trade? Because it yeah. don't seem like sort of a seamless pathway. There's no, a lot going on, isn't there? Yeah, a lot going on. Um, yeah, I studied. I love art. Like, I love drawing. Um designing just it's, it's always been in me like constant um so that's what i wanted to do that was the direction i wanted to go in but when i done work experience when i was like 14 or whatever however old you are there was a shop called the country way um, where we used to get our bits from and i applied there to do work experience me and my mate ken so we used to go over there and um yeah basically done two weeks and at the end of the two weeks that the the boss lady jan 
pulled me aside and she was like, um, don't say anything to Ken, but do you want a Saturday job? I was like, yeah, of course. Amazing. And um, yeah, mate, I got paid like 15 quid a day. Big money. Did you? Yeah. That's bus- not bad, that. Mate, bus fare was seven pounds. <laughs> Where are you coming from? <laughs> because there's no direct route. So I had to go via Insta- somewhere else yeah. and then somewhere else. And it was a mission. But I loved it. And that's if it meant, you know, two two quid for lunch. Plus I still had my paper out. So I was, you know, I was... I was but then surely you spend any other fiver in a shop, ain't you, on a Saturday? Constant, mate. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's sort of more I was taking wages in, as in tackle as it was like actual like yeah. fiber in my hands, you know. But... Yeah. um. No, and sort of, I worked there and I loved it, mate. I just sort of like to talk to people, get on with people, very passionate about angling, as you know, and it just just went really well. And I got to about 18, so now I'm studying at college. I'm studying design, and um, which is going great. Like, you know, I really enjoyed it, like, you know, different challenges, stuff like that. And then, and then my boss at the time, who actually works for Nash now, Kev Mardell, no way. Kev yeah. was your boss. Kev, Kev was my boss. Yeah. Yeah. What was I'm, Kev like? Short. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know, the, the funniest thing, there was this, this tackle, I think it's called the tackle directory or something like that came out years ago. Okay. And it was, I think, I can't remember what it was, but we had to have this photo and he, he stood on some like yellow pages. <laughs> so he was taller than me. Actually still a bit shorter, but yeah. Bless him. No, Kev's cool. He's Kev's cool. Lad. So, so Kev, Kev was leaving. He was going to lead her. So, um, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my boss just said to me, Look, you know, dangled a carrot. Do you, do you want to come and work and be the manager of the shop? And I was just like, studying at college or earning lots of money. And at the time, it was like a lot more money than all of my mates that are in full time employment. Okay. Um, so I, I just went for it, you know, and just went sort of balls deep into it. And, um, well, yeah, so sacked college off completely. Sacked it off, yeah. Yeah, which was, it's one of them. I mean, you know, it makes the person and it creates yeah. your path of where you go in life. So I've got no regrets. Like, definitely not because now I'm doing a, a wicked job, you know. Um, but I still, I think that's, you know, now with like the videos and other things, it, it's sort of, it's sort of my college days and my arty days all, yeah. all sort of come out. But yeah, so then I ended up doing that. Um, and it was like, I don't know, three years, maybe four years later, I was still on the same money and I was working hard. The shop was busy and I just couldn't see mm, any progression or anything. No progression, mate. So that was why I literally just thought, you know, I, I want to go and see the world and just experience like life experiences as opposed to this shop. And they were gutted, the people that owned the store. They actually sold it not, well, a couple of years later. We get, we get to that. Um, but yeah, so basically I just like, that's it. I've got to go. So... That's when I went travelling. Oh, is that when you went travelling? So you mm. sort of had enough, realised it weren't going anywhere, yeah. and then there was thirst for sort of new horizons. And you new went horizons, out. yeah. And then literally, so I spent a year away travelling everywhere, and then um, I landed back in Heathrow and um, got home at 9 o'clock, and at 9.30, my old boss rung me up. Because we used to stay in touch, like oh, email. from the tackle shop? Yeah, yeah, 9.30, and just said, look, can you come back? The shops, they, they'd like... Four departments. So they had um really good store. Like they had country cloven side, you know, selling barber and shimos and stuff like that. And then we nice. had the fishing side and they had the, the gun side and then they had the air rifle side. So, you know, it was a good business. Still is a good business. Yeah. Um but a lot of respect for them, a lot of respect. And uh yeah, so you said the, the people that they had in there, you know, the profit had gone bad and so yeah, so I came back and it was it was mental. I, I sort of I left there to do other things and I've sort of fell back in the same trap. So I sort of said, look, I'll, I'll come back, but for a, you know, a short period of time, I try and turn it around. But at the time, you know, say I was what, 24 ish, I suppose. I've then got a guy who's 50 and then someone else who's like in their forties being told what to do by, and it didn't really work. Mm. You know, they got the ump customers got the ump of me because, um, people were coming in the shop and just getting things for no money. Like how much is that? Shimano sixty ten and I'd be like, oh, it's ninety quid. Well, I was told seventy five quid last week. I'm like, okay, I can't do it for seventy five quid. All right, fuck it. Here later. We lost a bit of business initially, but you had to sort of go through that because we wasn't the, the tackle shop wasn't earning any money. Like, yeah, yeah, it was nothing. So we had to sort of just go through that. You know, we was a really good shop, and it was way before like the internet and stuff like that. So it's all about footfall, and eventually, you know, they started coming back. So it it was one of them, but it's sort of. You know, I, I I said I'd stay there for six months. 
you know, and, and another year passed and I was like, you know, this isn't what I want to do. So I can I w- imagine you being pretty flipping, I don't know, annoyed at that, mate. Now, that must be quite the decision to go back. Because as you say, your whole ethos about leaving yeah. was to go and then to come back. And you you know what I mean? They, they, they were good. They were good to me. They said, look, because they obviously didn't want me to go. Because yeah. they knew nothing about the angling industry. Country clothing. Oh, okay. So they were that side. Yeah. And, and the guns, they knew everything about that. But the fishing, you know, they, they didn't. You know, they've, they've dab- dabbled in it for years before Kev came. Mm. Um, but now it's, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and all these brands are coming out. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like a head fuck to them, you know. So when I was in there, it was, I knew all of it. Like yeah. it, was, it was just second nature and I could sell. So there was, you know, it was taking really, really good money, you know, and, like I say, it was before the internet, so you, you know, it's ridiculous walk-in trade, you know, and Christmas was just obscene of customers and stuff. It was so good, but but they were good to me. Like they did say, you know, I think a, a year in or whatever, they said, look, take another couple of months off. Yeah. So I went travelling again. Um, me, me and my pal went back to Thailand and and stuff like that, and travelled again. I mean, that was like well in me now. Like I like that sort of culture and yeah chilled vibe um and then yeah came back and then i was back in, and i literally just got to the end of the year and i'd i was so sort of despondent with it it, it wasn't for me i you know I, again I'm, I'm i'm now 25 probably and i've been here since i was 18 and there's no progression and i'm not about that like yeah but my boss always used to say this is way before i left whatever you go on to do because you're so like 100 mile an hour you'll you'll be good at it and i and I was just like, I've just got a, got a, me and my, my governor, Colin, bless him, he's not here anymore, but he, we had a big Barney. You couldn't argue with Colin. Like, Colin says it how it is. Yeah, down the line. And that is it. And um, I, we had a big row about me me going and and I just said, uh, I said, at the end of the day, mate, you know, I'm doing what I want to do, which is what you done when you left, doing what you done to set up this. So I've only learned from you. And he's like, yeah, fair play, boy. It's just like, Whoa. I was yeah. like, oh, shit, I've done him in an argument for the first time in like seven years or whatever. So, yeah, so that leads on to getting into my own my own stuff. and Fishing at this point, when, when you've come back, you obviously had your layoff travelling, you've been fishing while you're travelling, it's still in you, mm. you've still scratched that itch, so to speak, done some crazy stuff with other species. Coming back into sort of UK, UK scene, what, what was you fishing like at that point? Yeah, I was fishing a, a sort of a non publicity lake near me which was like mega i mean like a 20 factory and back then 20 pounders were good carp you know mm. it's still good carp now but like you could go there and and, and catch like two or three twenties in a day and they were proper fish like big scaly long mirrors and just nice levers there's like three or four levers in there you know just nice fishing nice. and it was at that time on that lake it was it was awesome mate you could literally don a pair of chest waders Walk out into the lilies, nice to free line worms and and bread and catch them. It was and you'd go out into the island, make a little swim. Like they're, they're small lakes, but yeah. they're just sort of intricate little, little dot islands, and you could just wade out anywhere. It's all changed now. Like you can't, no, you know, yeah, you yeah. can't do any of that now. But back then, mate, it was just mega, mega fishing, like fishing in the air. Like some of these carp were so cool, you know, like up to sort of twenty six, twenty seven pound. Um, there's one in there called Lady Die. I don't know why, <laughs> or moon scale Bert, as my mate calls it. <laughs> <after Scale Bert. laughs> but that was like the, the biggest carp. That went on to go like 36 pounds, but it, they were nice, really scaly, like a few fullies in there, just puck a nice old carp. And um, yeah, that's where I, I enjoyed many a good time on there, you know, Mad. with my pet. But it was it was so sociable, mate. Like we, would, It was so secure. Like we used yeah. to... Leave our kit down there. Go down the pub, the checkers or whatever. Have some food, quite a few beers. <laughs> yeah. Go back, flick them out. You know, catch a twenty pounder and and happy days. You know, it was, it was good fun fishing. Met some good people down there. Yeah, life is good. What did your angling become at that point? Do you have any influence around other anglers? Were you into sort of reading books, magazines, digesting all I, that? Was that I, never you? I all yeah. I always read carp talk. Um, mm. My brother used to get, I couldn't afford Carp World. My brother used to get Carp World. So, uh, yeah, I used to read that as well. Like um, Tony Davis Patrick. Yeah. Why am I like, oh, mate, I used to love his stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mate, he, he was, because he was doing it. Like, he was going around the world yeah. fishing for mental things. And, 
you know, the stories of him getting like shot in a drive by. Yeah, and they were wicked, weren't they? Mental stories, mate. So, so people like him and Leon, I can never pronounce his surname, Hojudink. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, when he used to fish like uh, the Orient and things, I used to love reading his stories. You know, all, all of them sort of things that sort of the globe trottery. Uh, yeah, know. the old yeah pioneer yeah. jobs, and then obviously Terry Hearn, who doesn't who doesn't look up to Terry Hearn, <laughs> yeah, but um, it was more definitely more sort of Tony Davis Patrick. They were like my vibe, Hutchie as well. I suppose it combines a bit of travelling, doesn't it? As well, yeah, and definitely. That whole thing. I just love that, love that. I, I need to do it. I need to do it. But yeah, again, you know, it's like Monday. you are a million miles an hour, mate. <laughs> even back then. The yeah. um the sort of journey into your own business, you said there you sort of left us on a bit of a point in terms of your journey. You come back stuck in a bit of a rut once again, doing the same thing, and you you sort of got to that point where you're mid-20s and you, you're looking at sort of maybe, I don't know, setting yourself up in terms of stuff. What, yeah. what, what was you thinking at this point? Mate, I didn't have a clue. Did you I, not? I had nothing planned. So I literally had enough of where I was working I, I handed my notice in I just said look I've just got to leave because I'm always going to be stuck here I was sort of doing a bit of labouring as well for my dad and uh, it, that and that's definitely what I didn't want to do mm. you know he, he was a sort of a landscape gardener and he used to always moan if it wasn't the weather it was something else and I definitely didn't want to go down that route um, so yeah basically I left with nothing to do nothing to go on to and it was like December, so now it's like the beginning of January, which oh. is the worst time of year to oh, do mate. anything. I hate January. And um, anyway, I was I was looking on eBay, just scrolling through, and I found a shop up in Doncaster that had closed its doors and just had a load of excess stock that it wanted to sell. Fishing shop? Fishing shop, yeah. I don't oh. know the name of it. It just it was just up in Doncaster, and it just had, it was like, you know, ex- excess stock, seven and a half grand. And I was like, well, I haven't got, so I haven't got seven pound fifty. So, <laughs> right. So I basically really naughty used. This is like probably a week after I'm not employed anymore. Used my previous three months pay slips, okay, and applied for a loan and got the loan. They, they didn't know that I, yeah. So You're angry, yeah, mate. Prebated the swim, went yeah. back and caught it. Check these three out. Yeah. So yeah. So I got I got seven and a half grand as a loan. Um, very naughty, but still you got to, you got to do what you got to do. And yeah, just got a van and just drove up on my own. You know, it's sort of, I, the guy emailed me an, an itemized thing and I was like, yeah, I can make some money on this. Definitely. I know how much I'm buying it for and how much I can sell it for. So I can sell it cheaper than retailers and, and still. That's a bit, bit of you though, isn't it? That patter, bit of a gift. You'll turn that round, wouldn't you? Weird Did you deal. always back it? Yeah. Oh mate. Yeah, I just knew. I was so confident. And yeah. and the, the amount of people that I knew in the angling, um, you know, the lakes I was fishing, just started to get onto Bard End then as well. Okay. And so, you know, there's a network of a lot of sort of serious carp anglers on there. So, yeah, I drove up in my van and met this guy and, and just loaded up the van with loads of bits. Like there's random bits, there's some cool bits, but I knew I could make money on it and literally come back home and I was like, like, where the hell am I going to store all this? So it's just like wedging it into my bedroom, like oh, the shed in my garden. Like my dad gave me one of his sheds. Dads love a shed, don't they? And he's got oh, yeah. like he's got like four sheds he had in his garden. So I'm like, Dad, can I have one of your sheds? He's like, well, I don't know about that. He's got. I'm like, please. Cause my dad likes to whittle and stuff. So I think <laughs> I, I, had, I had his whittling shed. Yeah, and um, yeah. So basically, just just then got on eBay, set up fish on online. Um, as my as my trading name, and um, just started selling on eBay and around and around the uh, the lakes and stuff. And it was cool, loved it. What was that like in terms of? Was it off the ground straight away? Were people sort of buying stuff straight away? Or? eBay was different then. It was so it was so good then because there wasn't. It's not saturated yeah. now like it is. It's not as competitive as it is. You could actually earn decent money without them, you know, sort of pulling your pants down on the mm. fees. So it's straight from the get go, mate, we just sold. And obviously I'd load and everyone knew then. I had a lot of mates. They were like, Oh, I need some three ounce leads and I need this and I need that. Oh, actually I'm coming down to fish the lake. I'll drop them off to you. So now I was like doing like a little delivery service. Career, yeah. Yeah. And I had some cool stuff, man. And and you know, in amongst it there was some like creamy sort of Shimano big pits, you know, yeah. and whatever else. So I'd I had some stuff to get some bigger money back quickly. So I've done check what people are selling for online, 
undercut them a little bit and just flip them, flip them, flip them, so I can quickly get some money back. Because obviously I got to start paying this loan yeah. off that I that I got as what well. What was the best bit of business? Best item? Best bit of business you done on that, mate? Because you must have got some rubbish with it as well. If it's excess stock, I might got loads of rubbish. I still, I promise you now. I reckon in the stock room in the shop there will be bits that I've had since the day. Um, I'm trying to think what the flyers were. I, mate, I had loads of stuff, loads of mashy bits, box bits, carpa rust bits, like you know, loads and loads of random bits. But I can't remember what was the, the flyer. But yeah, it just sort of went on from there. I sort of, um, I then sort of. I, I, just, I had such a nice life, mate. Like it was because I had a little laptop and um, I was, then I was getting right back into my fishing. So I had like, well, yeah, yeah, big time. So I started on Barden, which is obviously a local lake to us, which was rammed full of big ones, mm. like rucks of them. And there was another lake I joined called Spider Hall, which was complete different fishing, like completely different. In what way? What do you mean? Fishing in the edge, um, nice yeah. old oldens, like deep, crystal clear. And like Barden was like casting it out, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Rick Chod, they used to call me. I used to fish, just smash a chod along, yeah. yeah, just fishing chods. I used to catch them in the edge as well, but it was always Rick Chod. There he is, old Rick Chod, just blasting out these little <laughs> white pop ups out into the middle of the lake, yeah. Um, but it was pucker, mate. I, I'd, I'd have my laptop, I would list stuff, I'd sell stuff, I'd reply to like to people well, from the bank, from the bank, and then so I'd do two nights. So generally, I'd do like a Monday night, Tuesday night. So then I'd go home Wednesday, go to my bedroom, pack all my stuff up, give it to my mum. Can you uh, post that for me at the post office over the road? Yeah, of course. Then I'd load the car up, then go over to Spider Hall for two nights and then go out with my mates at the weekend and just repeat. Oh, the dream. Mate, it was the dream. It was, I love, like, God, simple life. Simple life. And then from then, uh, a couple of other shops come up, um, which was mega you know, and I had, a, and I had a couple of other tickles as well. So a couple of people come to me in the trade and sorted me out some stuff, you know, like I could sell, you know, I'd have the grizzles with that if that was happening now with some, one of my reps doing it to someone, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it is what it is, you know, whatever. Um, and then I remember I was on holiday in Spain and my mate texted me and said, there's a really good shop that's come up. It's gone to liquidation. Um, the receivers have got it and it's, Pucker, if you can get this, you let make some really good money. I was like, all right, sweet. So he sent me the number and I, and I phoned the woman up and um, I was like, look, I'm in Spain. When, when, like, how quick do you want this sorted? She said, oh, come and see me next week and we go from there. So I was like, all right, cool. So I got back from Spain, um, jumped in the car, drove up there, like went to this shop, mate. And it's just like. Where was it? Was the shop pretty local to you or not? Essex. I won't say okay, the name. Okay, People yeah, will know yeah, yeah. it. And uh, it was in Essex. And, um, Opened the doors, so I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm going to have to get a lock up. And a, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. this is mental. So, um, I had a walk around, mate. It was like everything, everything and anything you can imagine. And everything would have been mine. So, I wasn't just buying the stock, I was buying fixtures, fittings, counters, security cameras, yeah. freezers, the lot. Um, so, yeah, so basically, I, I made this, this lady an offer. And she's like, all right, I'll um, I'll go back because we've got a couple of people that have sort of making other offers. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, I, was like, I, d- I don't, I don't play that. Like, I don't want to, you know, have a counter offer come against me and get into a bidding war. I'm not about that. Just tell me how much you want. The classic salesman. This classic, is yeah. Oh, Lady, on. right here, right, right now. Here, yeah. How much do you want? <laughs> yeah, exactly. hundred grand more than that. Yeah, <laughs> it, mate, it was ridiculous. Uh, and she basically just said, Look, give me an extra hundred quid than on your offer. It's yours. hundred quid. And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred pounds <laughs> of my life, like hundred quid. But she goes, but I want it in cash and I want it by the end. Of, I want it all empty in the end of next week. Don't worry about it. it she's like... straight out down Basildon somewhere, <laughs> isn't she? Mate? Of course See she's in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Smashing it on the bingo. But, um, yeah, so I literally rallied up a few of my powers. We got like three loot and vans and just drove up there. And just like gutted the place, like completely took it all. And in the meantime, a uh, friend of mine, he owned a scrapyard. So he had a couple of lockups or a big unit that I could rent off him. So it's going to be nice and secure down there. So yeah. went down there, kitted, got all the racking, kitted it out like a shop inside. 
and just and yeah, just went from there. So I used to have people come down. I know, mate, in this kit there was everything. So I'd now had bivvies and bed chairs and yeah, alarm, all like the gear. all the like proper like trade packs of hooks on the wall, as opposed to like one size four, one size ten. Do you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had everything, and that the the money that I paid for that was like epic. So that's when I started um, doing lots of fishing abroad. So it sort of gave me that. I was earning more money. Um, so now I had now couriers and people collecting mail, which was cool because I was selling a lot more on eBay because obviously my catalogue of product is just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. quadrupled. So I was turning more. So now I started to fish like public waters in France and Belgium no and just, way. yeah, just doing a bit of that, which was mate, like 24 trips. I think I had in a couple of years just going on. Oh, you've done well then, haven't you? It was just, mate, the thing is I live off a shoestring. I think because I've got that, backpacker mentality yeah um so me and my mate we used to we went to belgium and he said what should we do my mate's cool like whatever i say he'll sort of do he said what should we have for a dinner i go oh poor man spag bowl he's like what's that i said i was i said you'll like it so you just get normal spaghetti and a tin of hind soup and just (laughs) melt cook the spaghetti down and then add some like Heinz, Heinz, like obviously it has to be Heinz, but Heinz yeah, tomato yeah, soup. You got to draw the line somewhere, mate. It's it? delicious, man. It is yeah. so good. And he's like, that is, mate, and it costs nothing. So I could go away on these trips. We used to, we used to do a fast one on the train. So we used to book four tickets and only use two crossings. So we saved half of the money. Yeah. Worked out how to do the crossings. So everything was done on a shoestring, you know. But it, it meant that we could go off and fish these most mental places out in France and. And the rivers and, you know, it was quality, mate. Mate, talk to me about, before we get to the rivers in France, the European sort of escapades, back home, Barden, the other fishery, Spider Hall. Spider Hall, yeah. That fishing at that time, when all this is going on in the background, yeah. and you're sort of moving on, you're angling on there at that time. You said you got mad into it. You got mad keen. Yeah. At this point, when you're you're sort of mad into it and mad keen, what does that look like? You're doing two nights. Is that you baiting an area, baiting a swim? Is that you just catching them wherever you go? What have you, in that time and that angling, what did you gleam over spending that much time there? Because that's a, that's a position that not a lot of people are fortunate no, to have. well fortunate. And, and you couldn't... Like the two lakes were so different. Mm. Um, Barden, going to Barden, this was back in the day. Bear in mind, it done the Kent record, so yeah. it had, had the pedigree of doing big uns. Yeah. At that time, there might have been uh, two or three 40 pounders in there. Okay. But there was rucks, and I mean rucks of 30s, loads of 30s. And there, it was like a Super Bowl. And now it would be. The Grenville of, yeah. like, do you know yeah, what I mean? Because, I mean, it went on to, to do some like massive fish and it was so close to home. So my style of angling on there was, um, hence the chods. It was like, if you see a fish show, mate, it doesn't matter if it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the morning, you wind a rod in and you blast it on it, you know, and you cast on it and, and, and I caught loads of fish like that. Just chucking singles, yeah. Singles, Always yeah. a white one. Always a white one. White milky toffee or a white dairy cream. That's all I've... Yeah, they were the ones. And the, yeah, on chods, mate, it was when the sort of chods were coming out. No one was using chods on there. And, um, you know, I could cast them anywhere. I'm not the best caster, but a chod, I can cast 8 million miles. You know, they're just like, they just fly and I know I'm fishing. It wasn't weedy, a bit of weed on the edge, like had a shelf, but a bit of weed there. But... Nothing out in the lake, and it was just yeah, just just blasting them out there, you know. You, and sometimes I'd fish over bait, like a little garden of pocket rocket, and just blast out God, some boiling. Yeah. Um, but we did before actually before because it was days only for a long period of time, and then it went to night fishing. And and at this time of when I was working with the laptop from the bank, it was actually night fishing. But before that, um, me and my mate, you couldn't night fish it, but we'd fish the evenings on there. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, basically, <laughs> we went down there a few evenings and we was backfilling it, just catapult range down in the shallows, like oh, yeah. just going down there and just backfilling it. We used to get this boilie made for us called the Whiteys, which the, the, whiteys. the whiteys, yeah, it's like a coconutty, loads of eggshells, nice. um, cheap man, three quid a kilo. It's all we could afford, you know. It's, it's everything's like I say, done to a budget, and uh, yeah, we ended up just like catching loads. And there's this fish in there called Alfie, which was the biggest fish in the lake. And um, over this sort of period of a couple of weeks in November, like a great time of year, um, down in the shallows, 
eight and up, we'd go down the mill, my mate. I'd finish work at half five. He was a greenkeeper, so he used to finish at about three. Nice. Four o'clock, he'd phone the shop because I was working in, um, this is before, Working in Countryway before I done okay. my own thing, he'd ring me up and go, "Hurry up, get down! I've already caught a seventeen pounder. They're down here. They're showing." I'm like, "All right." All right. So I used to finish at the shop, get down there, and uh, just cast out massive PVA bags, ginormous. What solid or mesh? No, nah, just mesh ones. Yeah. It's when they first started coming out. Like this is really early. Big meshed bag, cast them out there, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, I, I caught a few good ones. Like I had one called the um, the mate. The mates, mate, and these are like low thirties. So that's a it's a big carp now, but it was a massive carp then. You know, I was however old I was, twenty one, twenty two, and then um, my mate lost, which we think was a fish called the big two tone. It rucked and rucked and rucked, and he lost it. He was gutted, and then my rods just melted off. And one of the bailiffs, who was like this old boy, he, he was coming round and. Didn't kick us off, but he was just like chatting and he was a nice guy. And he stood there and went, oh, I'll, I'll stay here for this and watch this. Anyway, I'm playing this carp and it's beasting me. It's beasting me. Eventually, it's locked me up on the shelf and then it pops up and mate nets it and it's Alfie. Oh, the big one. The big one, yeah, which is like two foot long and about eight foot deep. It's like such an odd shaped carp. But yeah, it was like just under 39 pounds. So it, it's right now the, yeah, the biggest carp in the lake by far. Um, and me and my mate were like, this is the tits. Like, <laughs> we've got the shallow end down, you know, on our own. And we're yeah. ca- every time we're catching. And there was always the odd bivvy set up. Like, even though there's no night fishing, people used to night fish it. And then um, literally the next day we was planned to go down there. And, and um, my mate rang me up and said, I've had one already, 25 pound. I'm like, man, I'm coming. I'll just wait. <laughs> anyway, so I've gone down there and he's got his rods out. And uh, I'm literally just tying up these massive PVA bags. <laughs> and this car comes underneath the bridge. I'm like, God, a joyrider, like, what's that about? Anyway, drives round and no, it was the bailiff and we got kicked off. <laughs> mm. I think word got out that, you know, I caught the bigger. Yeah, you'd smashed him. Yeah, and uh, the bailiff, the bailiff who, who I spoke to was bang on and he said, he'd probably go, oh, Rick had the Alfie at 38 pound and fucking whatever. And then, yeah, the next night. So, we, you know, we got kicked off. So in between that, we then went and fished the ballast pit. The ballast pit is... Yeah, yeah. So that was like a lot of the like, pie and all that. They'd gone now. The lake had flooded. They're out of there. Ah, okay. So new. So it's new, like a new yeah. gen, which cool. Loads of nice carp still, like big twenties. I think he might have done a thirty pound. I don't know, but um, yeah. So then fast forward into Barden during the laptop days, working on the bank. Um, yeah, just just done the chods, just casting out, uh, uh, and then the, the spring was good. On an easterly, they loved the shallow end. So it turned to an easterly. They're gone. They're on it. Get down there. Yeah. You, you don't have to fish far out and, you know, just throw and stick, just, just you know, throw and stick baits out. And just caught loads, mate. Like, caught pretty much all of them. Like, you know, the ones that, the ones that went on to go over 50 pounds, like, yeah, like, you know, Cluster and the Brown and all that. But, like, in the spring, like, God, it's the Brown again. Like, the third time. Yeah. And just unhooking it and letting it go. And these were big, mate, like 38, 39 pounds. Um, I'd, I'd one sort of area which I really – favoured and everyone just walked past it and it was right in the edge no one no one used to fish in the edge like we was all cast into the island cast into the middle of the islands yeah. i was i was guilty of it showing fish cast to him anyway this one time i just walked down the shallows i love the shallows and i could see all the water was murked up so i just sat back and just waited for a while in this bush and then i could just see like one go whoop flop out and i'm like oh that, like when they're me to you away and they're like mid 30 <laughs> flopping out it's outrageous so yeah, I'd load in a little ten mil pop up this time, little white one just off the edge, and um, yeah, I just you know I'd, I'd had like a fifteen pounder, then I'd a twenty five, then I'd a thirty five, mega, and then um, yeah, I hooked one that I never caught in the end, and, and I played it for about they, mate, them fishing there rucked, man, they rucked so hard I can't even tell you. Like there's one in there called the rib, and he, he, rib. You, you'd know as soon as you hook him, mate. You go, oh no, it's the rib, and he would just like destroy you. <laughs> Um, but the big two time, he rucked, mate. And yeah. I, I, I bear in mind, I hooked him from me to you. He went out to the island like eight or nine times, like big 40, 50, 60 yard runs. And I'd get him back. And he was, he was on the top, like coughing water. And mate, he was in the water. And he's like 45 pound and the hook pulled. And I was like, oh. devastation. I threw my rod up into the tree. And two of my pals, because it was a park lake, two of my pals come down to see me. And I was like, oh, shit. And so they had to then, you know, uh, climb up the tree, get my rod out. And then the next day I caught a dog. Like I was fishing. A dog? Yeah. 
I was fishing. What sort of dog? It was a white, like a little Scotty. PB? Massive, yeah. Mate, like smashed my PB. <laughs> oh. But I was fishing so close to the edge. And you're not, the rules are like, you've got to keep your dog on the lead. But no one does, it's whatever. And this dog just come round, jumped, because I had my rod tips right back. I'm only fishing like half a, mm. half a rod length out. And this dog has just jumped in front of my lines. And I've just got, whoa, 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 whoa. And he's just run off. And I just see my line just pull round him. Yeah, my size seven stiff rigger goes straight St- into his leg. Oh, no. How's, oh. That, how's that ended? What oh, good you... fight. Yeah, he stripped some line. I was like... Get on the old rod, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was full power. Nice, <laughs> Mate, he was stripping. This woman was going mental, blaming yeah. me. She's like, you should have been holding your rods. I said, no. You... That's not how this works. It doesn't love. work like that. And then... um yeah, so I was like grizzles. I just lost a forty pound, and now I've just caught a dog. And then, uh, yeah, she went to the vet, and she saw my mate Darren the next day, and she went, "I've come round to find that young man. Sixty pounds that cost me." And I'm like, Fuck, like "Long <laughs> time, <mate. laughs> But it was it was it was wicked fishing. I mean, some of the fish, like, mate, it was crazy. Like, how you know how long ago was it? I think it was twenty years ago. Mm. It was like. You could go there and have like a 35, a 37, a That's 38. ridiculous, isn't it, mate? Yeah, and I, I caught my first 40 from there. Did you? Yeah. And, yeah, that was that was a cool day. I, I sort of moved. It was my fourth move of the day. Staying mobile, it, you know, it was that was how you sort of fished it then. Some some exceptional anglers on there that used to clump them, like, and they used to stay mobile. So I, I was staying mobile, and this one time, yeah, just cast the side of the island in the, in the sort of island, short chuck island swim. And, uh, yeah, just had this mental drop back, just sort of lent into it. I was like, ooh, another good one, happy days. And then as it come past me, I was like, oh, it's one of the big ones because there's like three or four of the big ones got like a two-tony line and this one was called the Classic. And it just like proper rucked in the edge and eventually popped up. I was like, get in there. It was like, yeah. The classic. The classic. The name as well the for classic. your first 40. Yeah, the Classic. But that went on to go like £54, I think, or something. Some mate, some of them went obscene weights, you know. But it, it was great fishing, and it, it's quite cool to 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 catch them. Like, I've, like I say, I caught most of them, and then ten years down the line, I got customers coming to my shop and going, "Oh yeah, I've just caught cluster at fifty one." I was, "Oh mate, I remember I caught that in the spring at thirty seven and thirty eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was decent, mate. It was good. And then the flip side, so, so leaving Barden on like the Wednesday morning and going home and freshen up and sorting my life out with the parcels and then going to Spider Hall was the complete polar opposite. It was like old, gnarly carp that had been angled for forever. Yeah. Um, really cagey and um, all wedge fishing, like mental wedge fishing. And I sort of, I got my ticket at the beginning of the year and started sort of walking around it February, like leading about and all that stuff. But that, that year was the first year they introduced some stockies. Okay. There's a load of um, simos went in there, and um, I think I started fishing it in March, and straight away I was catching. I was fishing out. It's deep, mate. It's like twenty five foot deep, twenty foot deep, whatever. I was fishing out in the pond and and just caught from the get go, like straight away. What stockies? Stockies. Yeah. And I was like, mate, I'm not here to catch fifteen, sixteen pounders. You know, I want some of the, I want some of the old ones. You know, so um, literally. <laughs> had like a little bad sort of run of not getting amongst them. And, and then just, it just like completely turned. They started showing up in the edge. So it was just like probably to the day, like the best fishing I've ever had. Really? Yeah. Just, it was when I first started to really, really watch carp and how they behaved in the edge and how they acted to rigs and stuff. Massive like learning curve. And it just, it just went like mental. I just like over the period of, um, I don't know, about three months, I ended up catching like 16 originals, which was like a mental year. And like loads of caught like the biggest two, biggest three, four mirrors, like, you know, and some of the biggest commons and just like all the the cool old carp. They're the pucker. And it's it's quite cool now because Charlie, who works for me, he's he's been fishing it and, and he's caught some of the ones that I caught, like... 20 oh, wow. years later, you know. The, that is weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's cool. I love it. And it's mental because he goes, oh, I had this one at like £26. I was like, oh, I caught that. 
And then I go, for, oh, there it is. Look. It's like nine, nine pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was just really cool fishing. And it was... Um, what do you see? What sort of observations? Because that's a key moment. I think there is those type of venues that sort of form you as an angler. But you don't get many venues. Maybe you do nowadays. But when you're coming through where you get that clarity of water, where they're in the edges, where yeah. you really can do all that observation stuff over a concentrated two-night period each week. Yeah. What sort of stuff do you see? What, what, what was what was so uh, cagey about and reactions to rigs, etc.? Well, the biggest game changer was um, they would come in, they would feed hard. So what I used to do when I when I got it like pucker, I used to do a night, pack up in the morning, like literally load everything onto my barrow, and then I used to walk around the lake. The lake was quite quiet, and I could bait like five or six spots right spots right in the edge. Okay, just hemp, um, clear areas, yeah, yeah, yeah. But some some you know. I always like to put a rod where you can't get a rod. It's fishing safe, but, you know, and um, so a bit of crumb, boily, whatever. Or, or places that no one would ever think of putting a rod, that's how I used to fish it. And that's how I, that's what I love doing and, and I've always done that since. Anyway, so I'll, I'll go round and I remember I walked up, first spot, nothing, next spot, nothing. I walked up to the fifth spot and they were drilling it. They were like, there's about six or eight carp absolutely drilling the life out of this spot. I'm like, oh, like fingers and thumbs. I've like, got my rig and literally just put a boilie on the hair and just, um, they sort of moved out and I lowered it in. Mate, I watched this common come in, pick up my rig and just go, Brah! like just like motored out the swim at about a zillion miles an hour. I was like, oh, you bastard. Rig settled. And I thought, oh, mate, mate, I don't know. And then I saw this other little common come in. These were like, I never, like, all this fishing here were like 20 plus, 25 plus. Yeah, yeah. These were small, like 13, 14 pound. And, and another one picked it up and just as soon as he picked it up, he spat it, spat it back out again and he was gone. I was like, no way. So I quickly reeled the rod in and then I had a coated hook link on at the time, probably snake skin or snake oh, yeah. bite, something yeah. like that. But I had some fluorocarbon. So I quickly was using fang twisters at the time, whipped on a like a hair braid, so a nice supple braid on like a blowback style mm-hmm. and then just whipped on fluorocarbon and, and put on an artificial enterprise maze. I was feeding maize as well. Lowered it in. Mate, every carp. Wallop. The, the 16 carp, every single one, as soon as they come in and they picked it up, I, wa- I watched virtually all of them get hooked. It was ridiculous. Sick. So that was like the biggest change, like just changing from a coated hook link. I, I think it's amplified in the margin. I think if yeah. you're fishing out in the lake, it's not as like like critical or whatever, but I think in the edge, everything is amplified. They, they feed different. The water's clearer. It's on a hard spot. It's, do you know what I mean? They can just behave different. And, um, that was the biggest game changer for me. And yeah, literally just went on to catch like all virtually all the big ones. It was, it was quality. That's mega, mega fish. fishing, mate. Isn't it? Mate, it, was, it was sometimes to the point I was fishing five ounce leads drop off. Um, like I said, I just, I just turn up. People have been bivvied up. Haven't done a fish. I just turn up and I just hold my rod and I just lower it and I just hold the rod. And you see the carp come in, you see <laughs> shake of the head, lead comes off. Yep, we're in. Like <laughs> 28 pound common. And like, all the stuff's still on the barrow. And they used to be like, oh, you got one, mate. I hated you, mate. This one geezer, he, um, he really annoyed me. He was, um, <laughs> he was on the other side. He used to do like a week session at a time. And he was there like in his pants sunbathing. And he was, I was had hoodie on, like it's 30 degrees. I'm up this tree and I'm just watching this spot. And he's like, the, the two bailiffs come round and they're like, fucking hell. I can hear them all laughing. He's going, oh, we're having a right crack. He's proper taking the piss out of you. I was like, is he? Why? And he's he like, is. He's like, I said, what, mate, you in the pants? I was like, how many has he caught? He's been, he hasn't caught anything. I said, mate, I've had like three this morning. Like, I'm sitting here watching these fish. I don't give a fuck what I look like. I've just yeah. got the hoodie on. I'm just here to catch them carp and... And that was what it was about. If you'd have had your pants on, he'd have been your mate, mate. Sometimes you've got, got a lot to look at. But <laughs> just a pasty little white boy <laughs> up a tree with a little, yeah, whatever. But. You could catch him, boy, though, couldn't you, mate? Uh, it was, mate, it was really good fun. It was really, really good fun. And that actually leads me up to opening my first shop because that campaign, so I'd done a couple of good years on Barden, moved on to there. So I was sort of doing the Barden like, and, and Spider Hall, which was like the, my last sort of spring on Barden was epic. It was just like, just catching, Club catching, enough. catching. Yeah. And all, all the big ones. It's like the year before I caught loads, but not really none of the big ones. And then the following year, it was just like, oh, another 30 pound or another 30 pound. You change anything between and, those years? No, not at all. No, no I was still on the charts. Cause I was still catching. Yeah, I was yeah. just unlucky, I suppose. 
Um, and then, yeah, obviously going into Spider Hall. And I, I remember it was my last trip was in July. Um, and I literally finished off. There's a fish that I wanted to catch called Flow. I hadn't caught Flow. I'd caught all the other big mirrors. Alex is the biggest one. Um, trio, like all oh, pucker carp. And Flo was the last of the big 30s, like mid 30, 35, 36 pound, real black, like mega looking fish. Mm. And uh, on my last night with my mate Cheesy. Um, cheesy. In the, in the, yeah, <laughs> Cheesy, go on the cheese. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the rods rods ramped off and I've, I've I've got it like in the net. I'm like, mate, I've got, I've got Flo. Puck, I can't believe it. The last morning and I picked it up. It was baby Flo, which was like, oh. yeah, a couple of ounces under 30, but still a nice sort of consolation prize. And you know, that was me done. That was, you know, that was me done on Spider Hall. And then literally you got the keys to my shop on the 5th of July. But in between that, you said there was a couple of trips to, there was a few, there's a fair few trips out to France, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, I've done it, yeah. Yeah. So how, how is that? Because that's, I mean, obviously it's in vogue now. A lot of people are going out doing that public yeah. lake fishing now. It's sort of that freedom element. But in terms of your fishing at the time, you're obviously on it, keen. You've got like this little, I don't know, perfect balance of opportunity to yeah. go out there and do it. Yeah. We talked about the poor man's spaghetti bolognese. But awesome. You should try it. It's an awesome meal. I'm definitely not going to, but <laughs> don't knock it. I'd still have it now. But that trip, those trips to sort of those public lakes for you, that, that sort of fishing, was it, I don't know, was it easier? Was it more of a challenge? Was it, what, what was it that when you went over there that sort of got it, was it the size of fish? Was it just the fact that it was no, pioneering? I, what was it? I think it was, it was the whole adventure <clears throat> aspect because okay. we never had plans. So I'm talking like AA route, like, yeah. like map books. That was it because it wasn't about, it's not like now, it's completely different. So we'd literally just have no idea. And um, luckily my mate, Dave, he was he was up for it. Like it was as whatever I wanted to do, he would do. Like it was cool. And he, he loved the adventure. He, you know, you need that sort of person to go yeah. with. He yeah. was up for stuff. Yeah. And um, mate, we would literally just book the train and just have no plans. We ended up, what this one one trip, we ended up driving. I can't remember, I don't even know where or whatever, but we knocked on someone's door because they had some lakes and they said, yeah, you can fish our lakes. Like, it's not, mate, it was like a Sunday night at like nine o'clock at night. Didn't even know what the lake looked like, but we just like went out in a boat, dropped our bits and bobs and come back in the morning and then late, you know, the sun come up. We're like, oh, right, this is what the lake looks like, is it? But I had some epic trips and caught some mega cars. What'd you catch? What'd you catch? Well, on that trip, Mate, some wicked ones, like some, no monsters, no monsters, but some real nice to low 40, you know, whatever, but pucker carp, but just wicked looking, wicked looking fish. But yeah, that's what it, that was such a buzz. And we, we fished, we fished mental places like Belgium. Um, but I mean, Nick, I spoke to Nick Hellier at a, a fishing show and he, he sort of gave me a rough area because you know, okay. I didn't know anything about Belgium. No. Like, like France, you can look at the map and you just got like blue lakes and regions and all this stuff and you can just buy like a regional ticket and just and just fish it. Um, well, fish it on the days you're allowed to fish it. We, we come unstuck a few times with that. Did you get, you get collared by the old guard the pesh? Had the times. guard the pesh march us off a few places. I've had gear nicked with crushed vans. We've had everything like... Everything that they can happen, but it makes the story right. Yeah, it makes part of it. makes the adventure, and it's you know I don't regret any of it. Like it's, it's I said, well, that time when we had that, and then fucking woke up, and that was gone, and yeah, mate, like getting stuck in the mud, and yeah, yeah, it's just it's just quality. This all part part of part of the course, but yeah, Nick Elliott put us onto this area. They said this area is good on the river. It's done fish over thirty kilos, so we're like, yeah, we'll we'll go there. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. And it was our first time fishing a river like that. And um, again, me and my mate Dave, this is where the old poor man's spaghetti bolognese came out. So basically we used to, we we went up and down this river, echo sounder on our boat and just ironed out batteries looking. And and in the end we found this area, which was cool, like a nice island, bang in the middle of the river. River's probably a couple of hundred yards wide and it just sloped off nice. I was like, that's where we want to be. Anyway, we'd sort of get in the kit out of the car and he told us the trick of, you know, they don't like the English, so just put like a bin bag over like your, your back so it covers your number plate. So I, I had a Peugeot at the time, so it's very French or yeah, or nice. So I wedged that in the front of a bush and then hung a, a bin bag off the back of the rear wiper so it covered the number plate. So, you know, we didn't draw any attention to ourselves. 
And we bumped all our kit down. No bivvies, you know, we're using bashers and stuff like right. no bed chairs, like just sleeping on the floor, pump up mat. You know, that's what we, he loved doing that. I loved doing that. And he, he would always go to army surplus stores and go, <laughs> oh, I've, I've got these new like this and that and whatever. It's cool. Anyway, we're loading up our kit onto this boat and this, this guy's come down and he's just like, no, no night fishing. I was like, no, 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 we're not night fishing. He's like, okay, but no night fishing. It's like, yeah, yeah, no, I know. And it's like getting dark and blatantly. So then we just go over to the other side of the river, hugged everything up in this bush and we just like literally use that as our little camp and then we mm. just had our, our four rods out. I remember the first night, like, got our rods out, pucker, just fishing to that drop off, my two, his two. And then you could just see, like... <laughs> I don't know what time it was, 10, 11 o'clock at night. The whole, the whole river's lit up by street lamps. Yeah. And we just hear this. You look at you like, what's that? You're like, definitely a fish. And then like 10 minutes later, 50, 100 yards closer. I'm like, mate, that's carp. Like, that is definitely carp. And then half hour later, an hour later, mate, they're, they're on us. And then the first rod just folds in up. You're like, here we go. And, mate, just like the first night, like four takes off the cuff. We caught loads. Sick, We had like 26, 28 carp in like four nights. It's crazy. It was, we had like full power paranoia because like there's people coming and we're just like, you know, like cooking our dinner on like severe like red light. Come on, let's get the red light out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're like military man. Yeah. Um, it was just so exciting, mate. We caught some nice ones. Nothing, nothing monstrous, but, you know, we'd catch like a, a 30 pound fully scaled and the next one's like a really long common. And then the next one's like a short, mm. that dumpy mirror, just nice, nice carp. Um, I lost a real good one. There was a, all the bites were drop backs. Like they go, and then the, yeah. the, the rod would just come flying back and you, you know, you're playing them. They all go downstream and then you just fight them and then you get them in. But this one, it just melted off and it just went upstream. And, upstream. Yeah. He was sign. just going. I'm like, Oh mate, this is a good one. And then it found this tree that had fallen in and, and yeah, hook pulled. But um, it was just exciting, you know. And then we went back a few years later to try and reenact it, and someone developed behind. Oh no! It was someone's garden. What so we were like, in. Well, we did do the night in their garden, so we, we thought, look, we can just be all stealth like because the spot's the spot. It's pucker. So we went over, and it was just it was just too much, mate. Neither of us. We were just like wired, thinking <laughs> thinking someone's going to come down and start cutting the grass and see us two. Yeah. But it's like set up in the all right, in, mate. Morning, <laughs> um, just surveying. Yeah. So that so then we ended up. I, I caught that night, and then we ended up fishing off the island, and it was I, I had like a twenty pound common, and then I had about twenty million chub, and we was like, right, time to go. So we went somewhere else. We got the security marcher off there. And then, um, yeah, we ended up stumbling on like this 700 acre reservoir and just like, yeah. As yeah, that, do. Yeah, that was pure, pure luck. Just found this, this res, which was lovely. It was just beautiful. And it was, you know, like a proper big beach on it. Load of people like partying and kids and families. Yeah. And, and then, um, yeah, we went out in this, in, in the boat of the Echo Sounder, found this area on the opposite side where it was just really shallow res. It was like sort of eight, nine foot. And then it just sloped down to like 13s. So I was like, that'll do. Chucked a couple of bottle markers out there. And then the weather just turned like on a sixpence. And um, so we had, we couldn't drive around there. So we had to ferry our, our kit across by the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the last thing, it's like that. Whoop, psh, whoo. <laughs> My mate's like, do you know what? Let's just like have a night off, have a few beers and then start fresh in the morning. I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. But I got to the other side. I went, fuck this, mate. I'm putting one rod out. Like, I'm just doing it. So I went out there and it's like proper white caps. And got between the two markers, I just dropped my rod off and I looked up and I was miles away from the markers because the wind was oh, savage. Actually, yeah, yeah. So I just threw like a handful of boilies and just like motored back to the swim. I thought like, that was crazy. Anyway, we um put some tunes on, treated ourselves with some like ham and cheese or whatever. <laughs> oh yeah, we pushed the boat out, mate. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, cracked open some beers and was on our, I don't know, like seventh, eighth beer, all of a sudden my rod's just gone beep, 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 beep. beep. I'm like, that's a carp, mate. And and cook, uh, yeah, just got one in like this mega royale, like big shoulders, like 39 Ooh. pound, like, and it was just, it just went off, mate. Like we ended up having an epic trip um, on there. We we caught over 30 carp. By, by pure fluke, just found this lake and, and caught over 30 carp with some mega ones. My mate caught his PB, which was like 44 pound or whatever. And um, because it, all the action was at night, 
he was fucked. Like, he was so tired. He, he said, mate, I'm just going to put in the retainer and just deal with it in a couple of hours, do some shots. I'm like, yeah, all right. So he, in the morning, like we've had, like every rod's gone. Like, yeah. it's kind of, and you get them out and they go again and it's just mental. Sometimes we couldn't get our rods back out because the mist and that would come on. You can, yeah, you can see. I went out once and I was like, leave that light on. I can't see where I'm going. And, and in, in the end, oh, mate, I, I ended up miles away. Just on the walkie talkies, like going, mate, I'm like, and just so disorientated. Yeah, like, it is, isn't it? We wasn't mega experienced on boats, but I was just like, what the hell? Anyway, he's caught this 44 pounder and he's like chuffed, my mate. He's so chuffed. He doesn't get to go a lot like I do. And he's he's got it in the water, he's unzipped the retainer, lifts it up, and it's gone. He was like, oh, he never got his picture of his fish. Yeah. But that, it was wicked, mate. Like, yeah, proper, they're mega trips, mate, isn't they? Proper adventures. I, I don't do them now. And I, I haven't done them trips in such a long time. Something but, you want to do, though? Yeah, I sort of, um, I used to run trips to France. So I'd done like two shop trips a year. So um, that my my time was was sort of spent on that. So, you know, I can't take the piss. Like, yeah. I've got to have some holidays with my missus. So yeah. my two trips abroad would be with the shop, which was great. You know, it was great for sort of, camaraderie with the lads that come in and, and great for business. And, and we had some amazing times, at, you know, fishing my mate's place out in France, but the fishing that I actually really love, that I'm, you know, really want to do. And um, yeah, that went on the back burner. I, I think, you know, if you think back of like the Tony Davis, Patrick and all that, which is what I love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's that, it's and, that mold. Isn't it? Yeah. And now it's, it's more than ever. Like before COVID, my missus and I planned to do a little road trip. She's up for it. Like just to go somewhere. So maybe, I don't know, I've got no plans for next year, so maybe I'll do something. He's crossing over, yeah. isn't he? But it's mental because I, I watch all of Samir's stuff and it yeah. just, like, I'm, I buzz, like, I'm just like, but... Yeah, man, he Because does. it's it's different league and, and, and Pecky as well on the Orient. That's just, yeah, I fancy that. I really fancy It's a bit of you, mate, that, isn't it? I can see it, yeah. Yeah, I can see it. I just You're love losing, that. mate. You'll go, like... Out of Mongolia or somewhere, you won't go to France, will you? Yeah, yeah. You'll be in some jungle yeah. lake, and that's got to be a carp yeah. in here, lad. Fishing for our pie, yeah, that. yeah, that would be the one. That that sort of opening your your sort of your shop, if you like, your first sort of stake in the ground. You talked about this unit. You talked about working through there. This mega time where you've got a great balance for a lot of people. They probably would have stayed at a point where they could do all this. Yeah, but you couldn't because the money ran out. Did so, it? Okay. Yeah. So so what happened was. You know, I had a few good contacts and I used to get some tickles here and there, but it, it was never going to last. Yeah, dwindling. Yeah. yeah. So all the insolvency companies were now going to the the big guys. They were getting first dibs. And so the likes of me were just like forgot about. So eventually, you know, it just, it just come to a stop. So I stopped earning money and it sort of come to the point where I was just like, I was 28 then. I'm like, right, come on. It's, this is, you got to... Yeah you know do something with your life so yeah that's, that's other than you know do something sensible and, and sort of a bit more grown up as opposed to going fishing and i was gonna say you've had about four lives there already mate. i know it was good fun mate oh yeah i don't i don't regret it <laughs> it was so much fun so yeah so this this shop near where i lived um it was actually an office building and it came up and i was like i could you know i could convert that into a shop so i had to go through or the council get planning permission to change of use. Ball Lake, mate, took like six months, you know, and I just wanted to crack on. And then, um, yeah, on the 5th of July, I got the keys. It all came through. They had issues with the exit, you know, cars coming out. I don't know if it would be good for a retail outlet. And the highway skis just came down, stood at the road and went, yeah, it's fine. I'm like, oh, my God, I've waited six months for this, just for you to say that. So, yeah, literally went in with a sledgehammer. And because it had like partitions all the way down this shot, oh, which yeah. doosh, just smacked them all out. And it's 900 and a couple of square foot or whatever. And I thought, how the hell am I going to fill this shop up, man? Like, it's so big. And um, I had all the racking that I got from that shop. With the oh, decent yeah, of course. One. So I racked it all out and had a till from that shop. I'd, I had all the bits and bobs. And uh, yeah, just racked it out and, and literally <laughs> within a few months filled it right up. But, yeah, it was, that wow. was the start of it, yeah. Well, I guess you know, during that period of time, angling's on the back burner, is it? Because it's all hands Ang the angling, st angling stopped, holiday stopped, everything. The whole stopped. lot. Yeah, it has to, doesn't it? You have to make sacrifice, uh, sacrifices. I ended up, you know, I was paying myself no like no money because mm. everything I earned, I still lived at home, you know, and, and Mummy Bear would always cook me decent dinner and stuff. So I didn't go without. Um, I don't even think I paid rent or anything, you know, just to sort of help me out a bit. And, and I just had a bit of money for... Bit of fuel and, and whatever, but everything stopped. 
everything stops because it has to. You have to sacrifice so much. And I didn't go to banks and borrow money. I didn't go to anyone to borrow any money. It was all my stock that I've accumulated over the years mm. and then just sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul and, and pulling in favours from suppliers that I used to deal with when I worked at the country way. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you've got relationships and a network. Yeah, there, so you? just go into them and like, instead of like pro forma, just getting credit straight away yeah. and, and stuff like that. But it was a battle, mate. I had, I had other shops that didn't want me to open up. So I had to, you know, really, really battle to get accounts with some companies. Yeah, of course, because they're obviously you're near other existing shops, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, as the crow flies, we are, but we're not. If you've got to drive it, you know, and, and that, there's enough sort of chimney pots in that area to accommodate everyone. Um, but yeah, that was hard. That was hard. And just constantly because, you know, you want all the best brands straight away. So, but eventually, yeah, it, it came good and, and we become, you know, very busy very quickly. But. Why do you think that is? Um, and also moving forward, why do you think that is? Because tackle... The trade has changed an awful lot. Oh, the trade, man, it's changed so much. It's it's so competitive, so cutthroat. But I, I don't, my ethos isn't that. It's never been that. You know, it's it's always about, you know, I'm I'm very experienced in doing things. So it's like, I've, I've always based it on, you want to go to Canada carp fishing. I could tell you where to go and, and what to do and how to fish. You want to go to Thailand fishing Siamese cop, I can tell you everything you need and all that and what you want to go tarpon fishing and stuff like that. I can help you with that. And so I always got the ethos of like information. We can give advice and guidance and information as opposed to being just a, a, a cheap, sh you know, tackle shop that sells stuff for cheap because ultimately they only have one direction what they're going in and that's out of business because they just don't survive. Like how many tackle shops over the years have you seen without naming them that have been the, the big thing, massive. Mm. Where are they now? They're not there. The, the diehards, the good ones, the ones that I respect have been here forever. Yeah, and longevity is a test of time, isn't it? Absolutely, mate. And and discounting like that doesn't pay my staff. It doesn't pay my rent and rates. And and people think you earn fortunes on tackle, but the margin is so small. And then you've got someone out there that wants to just carve it up. So it's just, it's just not the one. So initially, you know, I had... Uh, I'm young, I'm keen, I'm I'm enthusiastic and, and I know a lot of people. So people would come to my shop and, you know, we was probably more a carp shop as opposed to a, a general all round angling store. Um, and, you know, we just got, it just got good. Like people used to use us, we were reliable, you know, was polite and friendly and, and gave a good service, I think. That's a, that's a big call, I think, from at that time of your life. I know you said there you've got to sort yourself out and sort of, I don't know, build a proper life and put foundations down. But to go from sort of quite like a boho lifestyle of like, yeah, we're sorted, we're happy, I'll do my own thing, to something tangible where you've got to maybe sacrifice a lot of the stuff that you've worked hard to already yeah. accumulate. And then also to be in that position where you want to go fishing, you love fishing, Everybody that comes into your shop every day is talking about fishing. Yeah, but I did but you buzz off going. that. going. Yeah, but I buzzed off that. Did you? Yeah, I, I actually did. I actually, I actually, especially if you could give someone advice, like, try this. Like, especially, you know, my local Big Fish Lake was barred in. So people used to come in. I used to go, uh, yeah, take some milky toffee pop-ups, mate, and blast them out there. That'll, that'll learn them. And do you know what I mean? It, it, and it worked. And I used to, they used to come and go, oh, mate, I caught such and such. And I used to love that. Yeah. I used to go, yeah, that's, that's quality. And, it, and that's what it's about. It's not, you have to prepare yourself not to have the pleasantries and you know that you're going to have a lot of work, like working, you know, you don't go to a, you don't start a business and start at eight and finish at five. It, that just doesn't happen. No. You start a business, you start at seven and you finish at midnight all the time. Like, and if you want to make it work, you have to do that. So whether it's, you're in the shop all day and doing this and then at night you're listing and you're working out, you know what I mean? It's, it's always something. It was just, you know, I couldn't afford staff, so I was in there on my own, and then someone else come and help me out for a bit, and and that's how you just build up. Like I say, I'd never go to a bank and, you know, say I, I need some more money to start this shop because it's I've done that years ago, and I built up my stock to a point where now I go right. If I earn X amount, all of that is going back into stock, and that's how I done it, and just keep doing it and keep okay. doing it. Okay. So yeah. That's always been in you then. It's quite, I don't know, what would you call it? It's quite, you've got naturally sort of, I don't know, not salesman because it's not, it is sales, but it's more like entrepreneurship or whatever you want to call it as well. Yeah, it? yeah, I think so. I, I just think I understand how it works. Yeah. 
you see people come in. I see it in the store, but people come in and go, I've just started, whatever they're doing, I'm a bricklayer. And go out bricklaying, and all of a sudden they rock up in a brand new car and they've yes, got this. Yes. And I think, I just think, mate, like I had the same beating up Peugeot forever. Like I wasn't bothered, you know. And then uh, the next car I had had for eight years, I'm not bothered. Like that, what, what, what I need is stock on the shelves. Yeah. And I can't get that stock on the shelves if I've got a brand new car that's costing me £400 a month sat on the driveway, you know. It doesn't work like that. So whatever I've done, I just always put it back in. And it's, it's only recently that I've started reaping those rewards back because, you know, opening my new store, the much bigger one, that's like, I had to go again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and start the whole thing start again. Start the whole thing again. And, and I've always been off that same thing. I could go to that. I had so many people come to me and go, if you want a partner, yes, I'll partner with you. No way. Like, no way. No, I've it, grafted it. I've grafted, like grafted and a bid on the been on the breadline so many times and thinking, how the hell am I going to pay for that VAT invoice? And, you know, bad, like anxiety through the roof and stuff, you know, mm. but you just, you just go and it always works out. So yeah, you know, doing it on a smaller scale and then doing it a much bigger scale. It's no different. The, 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 the foundations are still the same. Everything's still the same. It's just on a bigger scale. Mate, it's seriously impressive that, because it is from nothing. It's not like you've had, a big old Lego poor Do you know what I mean? It's just no. Nah, you know, my mm. my family aren't aren't wealthy, and they they, I th- I wouldn't want it anyway because yeah. I'm not like that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm very much. Um, you have to learn. I've made I make mistakes now. Like I've I've learned so much on how to do things, and and if you just keep getting a little injection, little injection, little injection, what are you going to learn? Yeah, nothing because it's come from it's like frivolous. Do you know what I mean? And it's. Yeah. Every pound earned, you know, is spent wisely. But like I say, it's, it's taken so much time. Mate, it is epic, mate. Right, it is a really epic story and a long time in the trade. And as you say, to have that longevity is a mark of success testament to you. The, the moment where, for you, you could, no, it sounds wrong, but not relax, but sort of, you could then go back and maybe look at a bit more of your own angling. We're going to talk about a specific, a specific Kent water, mm. which is pretty infamous. Got a load of biggins in there. Yeah. You've done really well on there. But what, what was the moment in which you went from, right, I'm going to have to sort of shut the shop up on fishing, get my head down, get this done. Where was that pivotal moment where you so thought, I, okay, I now, actually, hmm. after a few years, um, I, I did. I wanted to get back into it like big time. I, I missed it. I, I, don't get me wrong. I was still going, mate. I was still doing overnighters here and there and and, and weekends if I could. But um, I, I got some tickets on some mental places like Roach Pit, you know. All right. Yeah. So I had a ticket on the Roach Pit, um, pointless. I had a ticket up in on the St. Ives up in Cambridge, pointless. In what way? Well, you just, so those sort of waters, they, you know, they, they're so demanding. You know, you've got some of the best big fish anglers fishing these sort of lakes, you know, fishing for the lady or or fishing for <clears throat> the mug or whatever it is down in the roach pit. Um, mate, I, I couldn't compete. Time-wise, you mean? Yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. And, or, or probably ability, you know. It's like um, different levels, man. And uh, But I'm, I'm a yes man. I say yes to everything if I can. I just want to go, yeah. And one of my mates, good mates, Ben, very, very – very good angler. Um, he's like, mate, I'm getting a Cambridge ticket, go and fish for the lady. Do you want to say, yeah, yeah, I'll go. Of course I will. It's only up in Cambridge. I could do overnighters up there. What's Cambridge? It's like a good yeah, two, two and a quarter. Away, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, two and a quarter. So I would do like overnighters, mate, and drive up there on, might be a Sunday night or on Tuesday night and then pack up at half five in the morning and come back to work and open the shop. Pointless, man. I don't, I don't even know how many nights I've done, but I could probably count them on like two hands. And Roach Pit was the same. I st- I could get a day off. I think I'd, on Roach Pit, I think I'd done 18 nights in three years. Jeez. Yeah. But it was like pointless because you don't learn anything. And like, you know, I might go a couple of times in the spring. I might go once in the summer. I might go a couple of times in the autumn. It, the, the, the dynamic changes constantly. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I had like a, a day or two off, then I could then sort of string a couple of nights together. But it was pointless, mate. Like. But I was so in love with that, like to go and fish for these mega carp. I didn't want to miss out. And uh, I, just, I just had to do it, you know. And even even fishing locally, I was fishing, you know, like Brooklands and, and Alders at the time, um, which is close, mate, like 15, 20 minutes from mm. my shop. 
And yeah, I caught a few fish, but my mind was never in my fishing, never in a million years. Like it was always about how the hell am I going to pay for that order? Or I've got this coming okay. in tomorrow. Where am I going to put that? And da, 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 da. there's always something. It's like anything like, you know, you have to be in a good position mindset wise to do this stuff. Like you can't imagine a boxer going into a ring who's got proper grief with the missus and, and, you know, the bailiffs are on his door and then go and perform in a boxing ring mm. because their mind is just like yeah, yeah, yeah. so far away. And I, and I realise that now. Like I realise like going forward, if I've got, like I've, I get issues, these, don't get me wrong, it's not plain sailing, but if I've got something that's niggling me and I go to the lake, I won't fish. Like I'll just, I'll, I'll come back the next day or something because you have to. Yeah, get everything sorted. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, when yeah. I fish, I fish. Like I'm hard. Like I just go like full power at it. And if I'm... If I've got something that I've got a salt, I can't, I can't, I can't, can't deal with that. Yeah. But yeah, that's I only going that. for all of those years of fishing those waters that I learned that. And I'm gutted now because like, especially the roach pit, you know, most of them have all gone and, yeah, yeah. and, and local to me, you know, some of them are gone. But don't get me wrong. I caught some wicked fish out of those lakes, but I didn't ever capitalize on what I could have. Like if I had the time now, Jesus. Yeah. If you bet it's always hindsight, isn't it? Yeah, mate? of course, mate. Of course. Of course. You caught a few subsequently, regardless of <laughs> anyway, mate. Yeah, this, yeah. um, the old Kent syndicate water, mate, pretty, um, pretty infamous, some incredible fish in there. Mm. It's fair to say, and we talked about this when we were planning this, pro- probably the only venue where it was about, it became about a fish. Yeah. Initially it didn't. So this ticket, basically I, I rung up Steve Burke, who used to run it at the time. I rung him up to get a ticket and the following spring he offered me a ticket Okay, and I backed it and it, which was like, well, oh, you don't back that ticket. I, I just, I was like, mate, I probably I couldn't afford it. That was probably the reason yeah, why yeah, okay. I said, but I want, we'll 100% have it next year. 100%. And normally the procedure on there, he's got another lake next door. You have to fish there first yeah, to get, and, on. to get yeah. like promoted to the, to the carp lake. And, um, I didn't get off of that. I, he literally rung me up, like he said, and, and he said, I've got a summer ticket available. Um, it's not a yes. Have you got to come down and you've got to meet me and we've got to have a walk around. And if I like you, you get a ticket. I'm like, 100%, I'll be there. You name the time. Anyway, we arranged this time. <laughs> and Steve, I, I love Steve. He's a proper old eccentric character. But when he wants to walk around, it's an all-day event. You have oh, to a full, job, full day job. Pack lunch. Take a chair if you want. Get comfortable. Like, yeah, like. Savage goes through all the rules one by one. And um, anyway, so I've I've got down to the lake and he's not there. So I've rung him. I said, Steve, where are you? He went, oh, Christ, didn't you get the message? I was like, no, <laughs> I found the shop and, oh, God, Peggy. Peggy's his wife. Peggy's going to be so mad at me. She, I needed a day off. She, she said I can go fishing and, oh, okay, wait there. I'll come and meet you. And I was like, oh, my God. So I run the shop. I said, um. Uh, Steve Burke. Oh yeah, shit. Sorry, he, he rung up to cancel once to try and rearrange. I was like, oh well, I'm here now anyway. So um, yeah, I met him, and literally from what would have been a full day carnage walk round was now like a couple of hours. So it probably that done me a massive like. favour. So he'd walk around the lake, and it's like the first time I've seen it. Beautiful, mate. The most beautiful lake. It's just it's sort of in between two zoos. So you can hear the lions roar. The lions call each other. So at night you hear like a, roar. you know, like, oh my God, there's like a lion in my skin. Yeah. But it's just very quiet, like just farms around it. Bird life's amazing. Size is it? How big is it? About 12 acres. Is it deep? Yes. Uh, no. no. Weedy? It's weed, very, very weedy. Yeah, it's got a couple of, the deeper areas are probably like 10 foot. But no gem, islands, no nothing? Yeah, two islands. I've never seen it, mate. I've oh, it's stunning. It's, it's just, there's only about eight swims on the lake. It's like reed lined. It's stunning, mate. It's, mm. it's just picturesque, like the most beautiful part of Kent, like just lovely. And anyway, we've had a walk round and he sort of stopped me halfway and said, I, I take it you realise that you're going to be offered a ticket. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't. No, oh, that's, that's wicked. And um, the way it works down there, it's, it's, you've got like four tiers of tickets. So you get a winter ticket, right? Which is uh, November through to March, then a spring ticket, March through to July, yeah, and then a summer ticket, July through to November. Or you can have the whole, the whole ticket, yeah. But it's dear, mate. It's it's, it's the, probably the most expensive club in the country at the time, and uh, I only ever wanted a summer ticket. You know, I'm limited on time anyway, 
Um, and it was expensive. Like so July to November then, yeah? 15th of July till 15th of November. And yeah. it was £900 for that ticket. Um, and then you're limited to 18 nights. So you can only fish 18 nights. In that period? In that period. So any three-month period, you can only do 18 nights. And you can't do, there's, there's loads of rules, man. Oh, gee, you man. can't do more than four nights in a fortnight. Oh, that's just hard to do my maths. So if you do, like, say you do a three-night trip and then... You know, like you're you're on it. You want to come back next week and do two nights. You can't. No, you can't you got an overnight. Got, you could do one night. Yeah, and then you can wait until the fourteen days is up from your start until you can go again. <sighs> but do you know what? Like I've spoke to a lot of people and they go, "Mate, that's mental!" Like all that money, you can only do eighteen nights. And I'm like, "Yeah, but it's really hard." Now it's different. I do two nights a week, but it's really hard to try and get. Yeah, I suppose. In that if, period, if yeah. you, it's, it's like one night a week, basically, is, is what it equates. But to. it's one of those if you've got something going and you want, you could, you could do six nights in a block, yeah. ordinarily, and yeah. cream it, couldn't you? Yeah. If you if you bait it up towards it, but absolutely. if you haven't got that option, then you have. Got yeah, a you stuck. But in turn, it, it made the fish just grow absolutely ginormous. It was never pressured, really. Mm. Um, you know, so his fundamentals were, were great. Like, yeah. It, it, the way what he wanted I think at, at one time it was the quickest growing 30 pounder in the UK like the lakes produced and, and stuff like that it was you know the fish thrived mate they thrived so um, it, it, it was just mega but my first year on there um, or first summer on there mate, I'd done like eight nights because I began time I can't get out so you know it, was, it, was, it probably cost me 100 pound a night to fish there mm. um, and then, then the following year might have done 10 nights so it, there's not a lot of time. Like I spent eight years on that on that collectively, but in time, in in terms of time, amount of time I spent on the lake, you know, I, I know people have done more in those, you know, in that period that I've done in eight years, more in a year. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. He didn't get loads of time on there. But you, but you pretty much hit the ground running, didn't you? You found quite a strong affinity with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I caught my first night. There's no one on. I've rocked up <laughs> like keen as mustard, thinking. You know, rabbit in headlights. Yeah. Turn up at this lake completely empty. And then I've just, there's a tiny little back bay. And I thought, oh, this is quite, you know, nice. This is what I'm used to. Like, you know, nooks and crannies, you know. And um, yeah, just, you know, just flicked out a rod down the edge and had like a 22 pounder. Um, that would do. Yeah. It was first night I was like buzzing. And then um, I caught a few. I, I, you know, I didn't catch any of the big ones the first couple of years. I lost a few. I remember the weed was Why, out. Just losing them in the weed, were you? Yeah, just absolutely outrageous, the weed. And just getting bites and it just playing it for ages. You, you had a funny rule, man. If, if you had a fish weeded up, you have to wait three hours. Three hours? Yeah, yeah. Three hours. What What do you mean? Before you get a boat? Before or you get a boat out. Three hours. Three hours. Yeah. So, so would you sit there with a? The t- you're not waiting three. No, hours, you don't. You? And you get impatient, and then you try things, and your line snaps or whatever, or your hook pulls, and it's one of. Is them. he on the lake all the time? No, well, he was about. What he done? He he run a very tight ship. Yeah, like you it. you couldn't like you can't go to the next swim, which is cool. You're yeah, fishing in weed. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had some one of his most mental rules, which still blows my head up to the day. Is like. You can't be more than 10 seconds off your rod. So if you're at the back of your swim and it takes you 10 seconds, you're out. There's loads of random things. But one of the rules was uh, an unhook him out of adequate uh, size, but bubble wrap will suffice. <laughs> bubble wrap? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, great, we got loads of bubble wrap in the old patchy and bit. I say you'd be, yeah. just, you'd be selling it. I was selling it down there. Go he on, wants boys. a sheet of bubble wrap. But yeah, some mental rules. But, mate. You can't knock it, though. What a place, mate. Those amazing, fish, unbelievable, amazing, amazing place. Like the, my best memories. I mean, you know, where'd you go to catch carp of that size? Like, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it was good, good, good fishing. Like a proper just. Eventually, when I got a bit more time, I was like, I've got to do my eighteen nights. I have to do my eighteen nights a year to to you know, maximize my chances of of catching these carp. You know, so I would sort of after the first couple of years, I've now got time. I've got two staff in the shop. Now I can make time and, and start to go. Um, and yeah, mate, just like, that's when I got into like heavy baiting with particle, like loads and loads of particles. I've heard this, right? I've heard this about your angling. We talked about this. You don't normally fish on clear gravel spots. You like the silt. Depending, depending, but yeah. Particles and a lot of them, but your own little mix. Yep. And 
some propensity, God knows how, to catch the rare ones and the big ones in amongst that. You caught a very special mirror. The fish that kept you there, we'll talk about later. But yeah. that type of angling, that sort of ma- not yeah, mass baiting, it's a lot of bait. Yeah. But it's particle based and it's siltier areas. Is that yeah, generally silt- right? Yeah, I like that. I like to smell my lead. So when I cast out and it lands in the silt, I know how it feels. I could close my eyes and I know what I want to fish on silt wise. Go on, describe that. Uh, a Not lead. closing your eyes. Don't Not close, close your eyes. I know, I'm doing it now. <laughs> like a lead landing in some flour and it's like, um, <laughs> like a, not like a, <laughs> like yeah. A, like imagine it's just a firm sort of silt and it has to smell right. What does it smell of? Can't smell a shit. I it don't, can't. don't like shit. No, it has to smell silty smell, but not rancid, black, horrible. I have caught over that. I was going to say I've caught over that as well. Yeah, but I don't. I don't like it. If if I'm, I would lead around. Like I spend so much time leading around, leading around, lead getting that drop, and then once I find that drop, I'm, it's then like inspecting it, making sure it's right. So it's silty, but not horrible. Yeah. No, that potent. horrible, yeah. yeah, real potent, horrible shit, you know. So it has to be right. And I just have this thing with with particle fishing especially of, you know, watery sort of particle, gloopy particle. Fishing in silt, it just, even when there's not a single grain of food there left, it's still in the sediment. It's still there. So the fish will just keep returning it and, and grubbing and, and you know, oh, so you're waiting for your seeds to sort of all the sugars to come out. It'd be really thick. Yeah, you don't it, want like fresh hemp with. No, like... I, I don't use. I have used fresh hemp. Don't get me wrong, um, but I, I do like my particle of a certain state. Yeah, so it's like bleh, <laughs> like like cat sick sort of smell. So where it's just been left for however long, just uh, really like let all the natural sugars and everything else come out in the bait and. They all do their own thing, don't they? Like if you've got like a mixed particle, you know, you've got like big bits like your maize and your maples and then you've got all your smaller seeds, tears, hemp, whatever it is, groats and all that. They're all doing their own thing. They've mm. all got, they're all releasing that starch, that sugar, all of that. And then they've got the crunch factors. There's so much going on with it. And I just think if you do it correctly, like you can do it wrong. Like, you know, the the, yeah. the, 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 the trick is what we found is like, if you leave lots of water over your particle, that fermented, horrible, well, I love it. It's like liquid gold to me. If you leave a real good amount of it on top of your particle, your particle will just keep getting better and better and better. Do you know, imagine like, do you know when you make a sauce at home? Yes. A couple of days later, a yeah. week later, yeah, yeah. oh, it's so much, it's richer. Yeah. That's how I envisage this. This, this is what happens with the particle. If you had no water on it, it will go mouldy, that mould, and then if that's it, it's done, like it's shot, it goes green, and you don't want that. But if you leave a lot of, I just leave a lot of water on it, underneath it's congealing, it's like thick, and it's just like bubbling, it's so active. And the carp just like love it, man. But you have to keep it topped up. How long would you would you get a, a mix last then, generally? For you to use it? A couple of months. Easy. Wow, okay. Easy. But generally, I was going through a lot. Like, we used to cook particle. We still cook particle, not so much this time of year. But we would do, like, three, four hundred kilos a yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we'd sell a lot. But, you know, it was always – but we've got, like, a little process. So it's always sort of fermenting and, it, and it's just coming out. It's – honestly, it's converted people's fishing that have come into the shop and gone, I'm, like, trying the party. And they're like, fucking hell, it stinks. Like, I'm like, just try it. <laughs> and they spot it out. They get it everywhere. And, but you know, they're getting bites. And it, in the end, it was – it was so much so that down the lake, like the Kent Syndicate, I was then having to bring it down to to people or those coming to my shop oh, and well, buying yeah. it. Made a mate dramatically change people. Was angles. nobody else using real particles? No, was it so, all boy the anglers. So what happened was it was <laughs> when you when you got the ticket that split up. So everyone's fishing the spring. Got some good anglers on the spring. Yeah. That mindset of like singles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stringers. Yeah. Throwing stick. Everyone's in that because mate, he's caught five or six this spring. He's doing all right. And, he, and he's catching on stringers. So everyone just fishes stringers. You get like the the new bloods, the fresh breed come in like July. And I'm just like, bosh, 20 key a particle. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Has it been fishing? And, and you know, it, it was like the second season, that I, the third season that I'd done that. I was catching um, and I was using a bit of party and I was using a bit of boily. I was catching fish. 
But when I just, I remember I rocked up and just like my mate, Tinny, he was down at Tin Pot and um, I, uh, he was fishing in the orchids and I was down in the corner, uh, Ford Corner, lovely swim. And uh, yeah, I backfilled it. And I, and I was on the phone just like, I said, mate, I've put out like 20 years. Like, oh, Rick Stave. With a spot. Yeah. Just, That's mate, some going, isn't it? Yeah, but I just like just getting the getting the vibe, like just get in the rhythm, put some tunes on, and I just I love it. I find it quite ther- therapeutic. I'm not fishing far, mate. In this corner, I'm fishing like eight or nine wraps. So it's just like a, the biggest bomb I can. Whatever, just just, just 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. And he's like, "Oh, it's a kiss of death, mate," and blah blah. blah. And in the morning, the first rod's gone, ding, like playing it, and it's weedy. It's weeded me up, and I've. Eventually, I've got it out, and I'm like, "Fuck, that's a big common." It's like, I don't know how big it was, forty-five pound or something. Jeez. And then um, the other rod's gone, and it's like another rare one, like really rare. It's only I'm, I only know five captures in the whole of the of history, what of like all of my time on there, all of the previous time. Like, but people go, I don't know. Like, people have been on there a lot longer than I was. A rare, like I caught loads of the all the rare ones in there. I caught like. But yeah, and, and that was it. That was it. That was the get go then. And then what I used to do was, um, now I'm like, right, I'm doing my 18 nights, and I want to capitalise. I'm, I'm, I want to, you know, catch as many of the big ones as I can. So I used to go down on a Sunday, rake a spot. I was well into raking, well, raking, yeah. raking, raking, raking. Yeah, gardening. I used to call it. I'm going to go down and do some gardening for a few hours, and would spend, mate, three, four, five hours just with a weed rake, blowing up reels. The amount of reels I blew up just by like pulling back and, you know. But eventually I'll get a spot that I'm happy with that I could get one, two or three rods on and then I'll just spom, 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 spom. And then I'll always do Tuesday night. I used to rock up at Tuesday night, my first cast, and I, I just knew. Yeah, I go, it's going. It. In the morning, I'm having one. And that, that, mate, that's just how I went on. What rigs over classically, right? I'm thinking particle here, using a lot of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't get me wrong. I fish places like Orshu where you can have mega hits. I can come across you and you can get them. But you can yeah. have those scenarios and situations, especially at the time of year you're talking about, mm. whereby you can get a lot of fish that come in. They can get quite preoccupied by those small bits in the particle, mm. even if there are bigger bits. And getting them to take a hook bait or getting them to, to get a run, maybe not get a a take, maybe they are taking hook bait and getting rid of it because they're they're feeding literally yeah. glued to the deck. For you, rigs over the top that you found effective using that type of mix. Yeah, what do so you use? very. I used the same rig forever, like however long. It's only like the last year that I've I've changed actually. Um, but I used to fish um, a coated hook link. You know, average size like seven eight inches. Nothing nothing special. Blowback with um, an extra long bit of shrink tube. I always had like a thirty mil piece of shrink tube. So really long. So I really, okay. you know, it extended that shank massively. Um, size four hook and a sort of a, a balanced bait. But I think when you're fishing two or three rods on a spot, you know, you've, you've got that chance, mate. And, I, you know, I don't, th- they, they certainly weren't pre- a lot of crumb. So I fished a lot of boily crumb. Okay, so there's crumb in there too. Hardly, hardly any whole boilies. Yeah. And, you know, if I put out, 20 key or 10 key or whatever it was, then I would put like probably two thirds party, one third crumb. And then I would get like a handful like that. 50 baits, maybe 12 millers only, only fish small baits. Okay. So everything's small. And I just think they just mate, these are big carp, man. Yeah. There's not that much for no, And there. they just come in and they're not there on ones and twos, mate. You know, I mean, the stock was about 55, maybe 60 carp at a push. They would come in in a few numbers and just go, you'd see it. You'd see it like fizzing up galore cauldrons. You know, they're on you. And it's just a matter of time before one goes. What'd you catch, mate? That mi- You had a very special mirror, didn't you? Mate, I'd, I'd loads, man. I'd loads. I'd load. I'd, I'd all of them pretty much apart from... Apart from um, there's two big commons, uh, yeah. yeah, one both over fifty pound, one probably not going sixty pound, but sadly that died. But I caught all of them, all of them, literally all of them. There's 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 a thirty pounder I didn't catch, which I'd love to have caught, you know. You know but so I'm scratching like uh, my mate had a thirty eight common, which I would like to have caught, but I didn't. But generally, you know, if you look at the stocking in there, there was like I say fifty five to to sixty carp maximum in twelve acres. There was probably at the right time 12, 13 that go over 40 pounds. And out of that 13, there's 
probably I'd say five of them go over fifty, and then mm. the one that's you know been up to sixty five. So why do you think that come those comments evaded you, mate? Do you know what? I don't know. I've caught all the others. There's like six or seven forty pound comments in there. I yeah. caught all of them and a number of times. But they're the two biggest ones. But they? the two biggest ones. I was going back this year because it was got in me bad, and it yeah. was it was like, what do I do? Like, do I leave and and fish other places? Um, but then I'm like, I'm never, ever, ever, because it's so rare. Like, I could tell you the last time it got caught, who caught it and what time, the previous capture to that, the proof, it, mate, it, it never got caught. It, and, I, it, and I never saw it apart from last my last season on there. I saw it for the first time. I saw Black Spot over the other side, which was massive, right in the edge. As this weed parted, he came through, and I walked to the other end, and this absolute ginormous fish was sat in the weed, I was like, that has to be the long because it's so big. And as it turned, the sun lit him up. And I was like, mate, I'm, I'm going to catch you, man. I'm going to catch you. But sadly, sadly, I didn't. But, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it, it's an epic, epic, epic place where the fish love the party. But that one, that it actually got caught on my particle on the spot that I'd fished hard. Don't say that. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was in Mauritius on a holiday with the missus. And I'm there with my headphones in. Reading a book, I was reading Terry Earn's book on holiday, trying to get my little ginger body tanned, and all of a sudden, uh, I got a text through, and I just went, "Oh, for fuck's yeah, sake!" Exactly. Like really loud. Yeah. Which is like what? And it was full moon, mate, classic. And and I was like, "Why did you book this holiday over the yeah, autumn moonlight? Yeah. My most favourite moon." And we're here, and yeah, and it was fifty eight something. Or, you know, mental. and then two hours later, you realise what a saddo I'm in Mauritius. I know, I know, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean. Mate, there's there was nothing like it on there. There's nothing like it. I mean that that mirror you you refer to, um, that was elusive. That yeah, was, man. That that once a year, if that once every eighteen months, it was a special carp. But that actually that was um, so I I had a good time on there. I, I, you know, it was that time where I was proper on the particle and all that. Um, but that one, I, I was fishing this swim called the Orchids and. Out in the middle of the lake, because there's no real big chucks. A big chuck on there is a hundred yards. Yeah, um, I could just I could see loads of tufted. Like, mate, you'd get like two or three hundred tufted in there in the autumn. It was mental. Like they were just coming. You think, oh, here we go. Like, right. You couldn't put bait out. They're just on you. Um, anyway, in amongst these tufted, I could just see these carp just sticking their heads out. Like, so I quickly reeled one on rods in and took everything off. Put a chod on. Meshed it up. Oh, you've never caught that on a chod? I caught that one on a chod. Over yeah. no party? Over no party. <laughs> and you know what? I've never caught a carp in there cast into them because I've never known carp to spook. Like, oh. So I learned, this is the park or fishing as well, that's how, That's why I always should to fish two or three rods on a spot. Normally three, like tight. Um, but you'd get them fizzing and they'd be on you and you'd get a bite and then you put the rod back out, you'd just kill it, like instantly. So in the end, I used to, I used to just wait and that's, you just capitalise. So you one would soon turn into three. Do you know what I mean? And then you'd, I'd wait to the afternoon. Leave them out and then, yeah. Yeah, bait yeah, up yeah. and go again. Yeah. Um, I had someone come in my swim and it, he was like, I take it that's where you're fishing. I had no rods, no rods in. And he's like, I said, yeah, mate. He said, God, you've got to get a rod out there. I said, nah, you can't, you kill it. And he's like, mate, you go. And mate, he just kept on and on. And then eventually when he left, I gave it like three hours. They was on me, mate. Those, they're still feeding. So that stuff that's in the sediment, they're still there going yeah. at it. I thought, oh, God, it's like two in the afternoon. I'm going to put them out at six. I just whoosh, cast it out, clip, donk, <laughs> killed it. Yeah. And I thought, because you can't cast past them and wind it in because it's too weedy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I'm seeing these fish show out long. So, yeah, whips one in, put a chod on it, blasted it out there. It's windy. It's end of October, and um, I'm getting picked up constantly. I'm fishing um, a GLMF, one of... Um, uh, Casper's GLMS blacks dark. It's lovely, and I've, I put some salmon oil in it, so it's gone even darker. It's all wick, and wicked. Meshed up, so they meshed up. Yeah, wicked. But I know it's safe. Yeah, it like, keeps dropping it like it's hot. That's all I kept saying. Every time it picks it up, it just drops it. Drops it. Oh, like what the old tufties? Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So my 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 hangers like that. Weep, weep, constantly going up and down, up and down. But I'm now I'm all right. I know I'm all right. I'm just having faith. And all of a sudden, she's gone. Weep, like blasted off. Tufty. And I've gone, that ain't a tough thing. I've picked up into it instantly. I know it's one of the big ones. And it's just like 
proper pulling. Like proper going, 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 going. Oh, mate, it's ridiculous. I'm thinking, oh, God, and it's now it's kiting at a massive arc, oh. and it's weed savage. So now it, it was probably over 100 yards, just over 100 yards I hooked it. It's now 120, but now arcing, and it's going over the shallows where the island is, and it's coming back round, and I'm playing it, I'm playing it, I'm playing it. I think I can't do anything with this. It's just locked me up solid, and I'm just going, oh, jokes, proper like. Anyway, uh, Terry Dempsey was fishing on the point. Oh, legend. Yeah, good old tell. I rung him up. I'm like, tell, mate, I've just hooked a kipper, and it's just like kited left. It's gone into the helipad. It is locked up. He went, ring Berkey, tell him you've had it on for three hours. I was like, oh, yeah. So a three-hour rule. Yeah. So I rung up Berkey. I went, said, Steve, I've had a fish on. He said, okay, how long you had it on for? Probably getting on for three hours now. <laughs> How long have you really had it on for? Oh, 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's like, okay, I'll come down. So everyone's sort of reeled in and they've come round and, and tails come round. And we've jumped into the boat and we've just like wound down and I've just followed this fish. And we've come to this like ginormous weed bed. Like a, like a two man. Like imagine an old Hutchie apophysis. It was just like that. Like a dome with a door in it. Oh, and I could see my line going into this thing. And I was like, right, it's down there. As we've got closer, the fish has then come up and, and in this hole in the weed. So my line's going down there and it's come back up. Oh. It's just rolled. And I've just gone, fuck, it's the big plated. It's the big fucking plated. It's the big plated. Like <laughs> last time it was out, it was like 53 pounds or something. Jesus. It's like the queen of the lake. It's like everyone's number one. And I'm like, oh my God. And... And it's like rucking now, and on my line, I've got no direct That's contact. Horrible, isn't it? When it's oh, horrific! Bed. Like absolutely, like I was shitting it, mate. Yeah. Like, and it's rucking, it's going crazy, and 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 luckily, Steve Burke had a metal frame landing it. So if we had to yes. go out in the in the weed, yeah. we can push it. Anyway, this fish is coming up, and it's like going berserk. The Dempsey's got the net and he's scooped it under it. He's got it in. I'm like, oh my god! Like the elation, it was like. I can't believe it. I can't believe I've caught the big plate, the most wanted carp, like ridiculous. And yeah, we got it back and, and everyone, there's loads of people come round and, and it's always like Steve's very precious of his fish. So there was, mm. you know, it's like added pressure. Yeah, yeah, added yeah, pressure. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get, I've got to be honest, didn't get the best pictures of it. I got some nice ones, but the memories there, but you know, it's uh, 50. Yeah. No, it was 48 something. I don't know. Really I doesn't mate, not bothered. Like, it was just the best carp like I've ever it's caught. Sick Still to this day, the best carp I've ever caught. And it was just, it was mental, mate. And it was just the scales were like, I don't know, some of the scales were like pfft, half dinner plate size. And it was just epic. Like I say, very, very rare. It was caught 18 months before that at 53. Um, just the most incredible mouth was immaculate, just beautiful mega carp. And then, um, yeah, waddled off. See you later. And then uh, literally 13 months to the day, it got caught again, which was when it was 83 pounds. Jesus. Yeah. So whatever it had, poor thing. Um, yeah. yeah, mental fish, mate. Like <sighs> the most outrageous carp. Mental place, mate. Mate, I had so many good times on there. Like big ones, big hits. It's Crazy. weird, mate, as well. Like for you, and we talked about it in planning, like, when we won't probably talk in detail about Ashbury, but again, it's another place where you've gone where like there's people fishing it. A lot of people fishing it like regularly. It's yeah, that yeah. type of water. Obviously the quality of the fishing, the quality yeah. of the fish you've done really well. And you seem to have that innate ability with your type of angling of sort of flitting around different venues. And this is home and abroad because we've been to Belgium and you talked a little bit about yeah. France where you can drop on you have got that nature of just working, being a bit ADHD up at night, moving around, yeah. all that sort of stuff that's in you. You can see it and fishing hard. But you also have that ability to be able to just produce on different types of venue because they ain't all the same type of venue. Fishing that Kent Syndicate in that style was completely different to the local syndicate that I've spent like this summer on, really. It's like the polar opposites. Like, you like that though, don't you? Love it. That's what I'm saying. It's I love that buzz of learning and working it out. Like this other place, which I'm sure we'll touch on, but 
I, I was getting done over and I was running away from my spot, watching him in the edge, like doing me and going, ha, 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 like a villain, like, I'll get you. Don't worry about that. Like, you know, all my best stuff isn't working. I'm like, oh, don't worry. I'll work it out. I'll work it out. And that's what I buzz off like. Mega. Absolutely. What were they doing you? What do you mean? Like you were seeing them turn your rigs over? Yeah, I've seen them turn my rigs over, but it, it was actually more to it than what I actually thought. But that was that was coming through to checking spots at night, like two or three times a night and working out. Go on. Give me some detail here. This sounds good. Yeah. So you have to go and lamp them up at nine. So lamp yeah. them up. Yeah. And it was eels, man. I was getting done by eels. Oh, no. Yeah. So, but I, I, I have, to, I have. Watch myself get done by carp many times on there. Mm. Um, but I changed completely how I fished. Like my normal rigs completely changed. Like it all completely changed. In what way? Just went on to just normal braided hook links. Soft braid. Yep, soft braid, 18 pound hook links, short, big leads. Yeah, just yeah, just completely not how I normally fish. And it just tricked them big time. <laughs> like jokes. Balanced hook baits, you know, just yeah, lot and lots of bait. No, no mixed particle. You ain't shy, are you on bait? No, but I learnt. I learnt though that, mate. These these eels were massive, man. Like they were ginormous. They were like massive, like congas, and they were just smashing the spot. Yeah, like smashing it. So I I could have fed them ten times that, and they yeah, still would have through bait. it. Yeah, so yeah. I just learned. That I just if I just kept baiting it throughout the night, no one was doing that. I was baiting heavy, like heavy at night. And then in the morning, when when the eels, once the light sort of, it's on that sort of change, the eels would disappear, the carp would come in, I'd catch them. But it was, yeah, it was mega. Mega. (laughs) Mate, some angling. Mm. For you, when you, obviously, we sort of hinted at it, there's other species, you like your chew pike fishing, don't you? You like your predator fishing, your lure fishing this time of year, sort of doing that to keep things fresh. When you... When you sit back throughout the course of your life, as you just talked about, you've had periods of time where you've sort of reached a level with things, however sustainable or unsustainable that would be, don't really know, but you, you've sort of switched up and you've had to sort of up the ante in some aspect or another. For you now, you talk there about you've got the balance, you've got your fishing back. Life is very much at a point where, I don't know, it, I wouldn't say a coast because that's not fair, but things are good. Things have been good. The shop is in a really good place. Your angling's in a really good place. Life is in a really good place. Is there another up the ante to do for you? Is there another big hit? Because I feel that you're a character that sort of not craves it, but you ain't one to be a, a coaster at any point. Uh, do you know you? what? My my outlook's completely changed. Has it? Yeah. It's it's. I always wanted, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love catching big carp. Like, I love going fishing for big carp. Love it. But now I'm, I think because if we go back to the, the, the Kent syndicate, like catching all those big ones and then catching the biggest one at an obscene weight, since then it's completely changed me. Like it was 60 pounds there, wasn't it? Yeah. So that's going to change you, isn't it? Yeah, completely. And it's like, I don't think... And it's a it's a proper sixty pounder, born in the lake. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't think that. I don't know. I, I I genuinely don't think I'll be fishing for a fish as big as that ever. Like, I mean, I'm, who knows what happens in ten years? There could be sixty pounders in every lake because look what's changed. But I think to go through that and experience that now going forward, it's. I don't know. I, I've just I'm not like. I have to join that lake because it's got fifty pounders in. Okay, I'm not about that now. And it's really weird. And it's it's only like the last I don't know, six months. I, I enjoy I enjoy fishing for nice looking carp mm. and I enjoy fishing for big carp. But they don't have to be fifty pound big. Don't get me wrong, I like I like to catch forty pounders, of course. But I'm not like you know, a lot of them now. I've stopped weighing fish some of them now. Okay. And I don't I've never done that. Like, you know, I can look at it and go, oh, it's thirty one. But you know, Going to Ash's place, I, I wasn't weighing him, but because obviously he's got a, a, a stocking yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. he wants to know the weight. So you go, how big was it? I go, about 21. And how big was that? Oh, about, it's like, oh, what I mean you're about? I, said, I didn't weigh him. He's like, oh, mate, I just want to know how to put him. And I get that. So I'm like, yeah, cool. I'll weigh him if I fish there. And my other mates, um, RG fisheries, I'd weigh them because it's the same. But generally, like, fishing the local sort of syndicate where I was, I was catching some bangers, some absolute 
weapons of carp and, and going to about 35. I'm not yeah. going to, I just, I don't know. It's I, not a thing. Yeah, it's not yeah. a thing. I mean, it, if I think it's going to go 40 pound, I'm going to weigh it. But like, okay, so there's still something there. There's still something there, but I, it's not a massive thing where I used to weigh absolutely everything. I'm not, I'm, it's not about that. It's, but it's only this year that it's changed because I've, I've never been like that. My mindset's always been, yeah, like you just, it's just routine, isn't it? Get it, get it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weigh it. Yeah, oh, yeah. 36, 12, pucker. Yeah, photos. See you later. 36, 12. And now it's get it in, get some nice shots. You've I'll- gone big time, haven't you? <laughs> no, I just think, I just think, I don't know. I don't, there's a massive fascination about weights of stuff, like massive, like not just carp. It could be pike. You know, we all want a 30 pound pike or a 40 pound pike or a five pound perch. There's a mass and, it, and I get it and I do get it. And I think with, with carp fishing, you know, catching that carp, which was like so big, like in, in the UK terms. And it's just, I don't know. It's just. I just, I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't wait. It's just my outlook's changed. I'm not about, I'm not about that. Like there's a, there's one fish in the lake local to me that, um, so basically the long, the, the long common died. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I had, I had nowhere to go really. I'd, I got tickets. I got lots of tickets. So I thought I'd, I'd concentrate my time on this other venue that I've been sort of dropping in and out of for a few years and caught some, some wicked carp. And this one fish that really captivated me, like it wasn't the biggest by no stretch of the imagination, but it was just the best. It was the best carp. And after having such a mental summer on there, like catching like all of the big ones, like yeah. literally all of them. Stock, yeah. Um, you know, I, I sort of, I sort of, I was joining that lake again just for this one carp. And it's like mid thirty. But it's such a cool carp. It's the best carp. Like in that lake, it's the best. Like above others. And the others are mega. Yeah. There's, there's a mega fish. And then when I did catch it, I, I it was a fluke because I was meant to go up to Ashby Top Lake, but I checked the plan and it was booked. I was like, oh man, what do I do? Yes. What do I do? What do I do? And I've, and I've just come back from holiday and I, I literally done my summer on there, caught what I caught. I thought, I've had mega summer. That's it now. I'll, I'll put it to bed now till next summer. And I'll try and go for that mirror. Anyway, I ended up going down this lake and as luck by have it, I, I've dropped in a swim, found some fish, made a bit of carnage, like led in around. I thought I'm going to bait it, I'm going to rest it, I'm going to leave it. And whilst doing that, a fish showed in the corner around this little bay. So I thought, oh, while I'm waiting for that to sort of calm down and let the dust settle, I'm going to take one rod and flip it out there. So I just got a solid bag and just side cast up the side of this tree. Hour later, rod smacked off and it's come round. And as it's come up the shallows, on this shelf, I could see, I knew which one it was the, the ultimate carp in my opinion. And I was just like, that is it. That is it. And I had this guy, Nick with me and, um, he netted it for me. And I said, tell me what it is. He's like, sea scar, mate. I was like, oh my God, I knew it was. And it just, it, it wasn't about weights or anything else. You know, like my mate, Ant, who runs the lake, he's like, how big was it? I said, mate, I didn't even weigh it. He's like, oh, of course you didn't. You flashed it. I said, it's not about that. Like the whole thing was to try and catch that carp and get it in the album because it was, it's worth more than a, a number. Do you know what I mean? The so one. It was the one. And it's, you know, there's fish in there 10 pound bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was just like the one. And it just, I just wanted to respect it, look at it and just have some pictures and just put it back. Some angling, mate. What about the shop? <laughs> I said another kick, another gear. You, What's the future there, mate? You do a great job. It's a successful shop. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I always liked, I like to be busy. I like to do things. We're big involved in the shows. You know, we partner with a lot of the big companies now. And, and you know, we do sort of three shows a year, which is busy. The shop's just, the shop's getting busier and busier and busier. Um, we get people from all over. No one's got a store like mine, like. Genuinely, I, I I will say it like it's big, you know, like I say, we're big into all different types of fishing. So yeah. we've got a lure casting demo tank so you can chuck some lures about and, and you know, because we, we love all that. Um, you know, we have big lure areas, big specialist areas, you know, we're massive on carp. We have bivvies on display. We have bed chairs out, you know, it is, it's an experience. We've got a nice big fish tank in the middle of it. You know, like we was the first to do that like properly. Um and I just, I, you know, people come from all over. So the shop's getting busier. It's got a good name because of the, we hold massive stock, like loads yeah, of stock. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we're all nice and polite and friendly. You know, I've got a good team and enthusiastic and passionate about fishing and, like I say, not just carp fishing. So 
I think we just carry on doing what we do, you know, like just as long as we keep going that way, the right way going up and if we start going backwards, then yeah, I'll have to reevaluate things. But at the minute it's a, it's a good balance. I've, I've given myself content creator title. So that's, have my, you? that's, that's my title now. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. Give yourself your own title. Yes. Yeah, so I just go out and catch Aww. fish and, and put them up. That's, that's all I, that's all I do now. Um, no. But no, no, I'm, it's it's in a place now where a lot of my work, like the lads are great. They've got their own customers and, and you know, they, they deal with people um, how I want them to be dealt with. Because at, at the beginning, it was always like, it's ricking, it's ricking. Yeah, yeah, and you're yeah like, okay. Hello, mate. You go, yeah, um, oh, can you send me a pint of maggots? I'm thinking, oh my God, mate, you could have just like... But now it's not like that now, you know, you still get the odd person of that want to that wanna talk to me. But generally, I've sort of just sort of phased my way out. Um, and I, you know, most of my stuff is office based now, mate. I'm just up in my office yeah. okay. doing all the boring stuff like invoices and paying and, you know, VATs and tax and all of the insurance, oh, all that stuff. But it means, you know, that I can now work mobile. So that's why I go, I go fishing. I always do 48 hours fishing a week and I take my laptop and I will be sat there at one o'clock in the morning doing stuff. If, if, it, if it means, you know, that I've got the rods out then. That's my office. I'm, I'm, I'm well content with that. Well happy with that. Mate, I think it's brilliant. I think you're a charismatic bloke. I've genuinely, even planning this pre-plan, it's brilliant to sit down and talk to you. I need to come and see the shop. But as well as that, there's some incredible angling chapters and just like a real interesting mix of like personality, life and all sorts in there, mate. Mm. I think it, yeah, it's a thoroughly wicked story, but also just like an inspiring boat. You genuinely are, mate. So thank you so much for coming in and sharing those tales. You're welcome, mate. mate. Before I let you go. Right. Quick five questions, mate. Ooh. These are easy. Yeah, I knew these were coming. Do you know what I mean? Easy. Right. Uh, First one. Yeah. Sell your shop. Yeah. Ooh. Keep all your fishing gear. Yeah. Sell your fishing gear, but keep the shop. Oh, mate, that's a well out of question. You've got sentimental value in that fishing gear. I know you have. I've got sentimental value, but I've also got staff with lives. There is that. So I'm a, I'm a team player. Let's say sell the fishing gear. I'll take up golf. I've heard it's all right. <laughs> You're having a mare, mate. you caught enough anyway. Uh, one angler to catch a carp to save your life. Uh, my mate, Ben Ben Jeffrey. Ben Jeffrey. Yeah. Get him on. Get him on, yeah. Right no, he's very, very, very secret uh, squirrel. But yeah, I know a lot, a lot of good anglers, but... Yeah, he's very natural. That's a good shout. Um, three celebs you'd take fishing and why? Past or present? Um, do they have to be celebs? Yeah, we were talking about them before, mate. We could have any of them. <laughs> Brett <laughs> the Hitman Hart. Brett the Hitman Hart, Legion of Doom, Legion Pat Sharp. Of Do- oh, my God. Oh, what an, oh, incredible, yeah, what an incredible social. Role. Yeah. Um, three celebrities. Do you know what? I, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd rather take my nana granddad and my dog. Oh, I love that, mate. Yeah, because they're, they're celebs to me, so yeah. What a wholesome answer, mate. No, but it's true, though, isn't it? I, I love I, it. I, yeah. I love it, mate. I've got a lot of time for that. Drum and bass or country and western? <laughs> mate, I was listening to Johnny Cash yesterday, man. Oh, yeah. I love I loved a bit of country. I like a bit of drum and bass. I'm not like, you know, but I, I do love a bit of country, yeah. Why not? Yeah, no, nothing wrong Bring with that. Bring a fire, country, mate. mate. Bring it on. <laughs> well, <laughs> you've not had the catering. Um, yeah. What's your idea of cutfish in hell? Um, carp fishing hell. People adjusting their hangers with the buzzers full blown. That's just good angling, isn't it? Yeah, just just carnage. Reeling through the alarms. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. I don't like that. (laughs) I do it. Like, but I was doing it last night. But there's no one on the lake, so I could do it. But when there's a zillion people, it's it's annoying. Give you that. Uh, Best and worst thing about owning a tackle shop. Best thing is that I get lots of free tackle. Nice. Worst thing, everyone thinks that you're a multimillionaire. Which you are. So technically, <laughs> correct. <laughs> I wish. Fantastic. No, billionaire. Let's get it right. Yeah. Um, history carp, you wish you caught. History carp. Oh, that's a real good one. Um, Heather the lever. Nope. I'm lying to you. The dustbin. Oh, yeah. I think the dust. I don't know why I said Heather. Um, the dustbin to me, I love that shape, and that has always been my most favourite calf of all time. And I like shoulders. Yeah, I love shoulders from Horton. Horton I love yeah. that. Yeah, but but the dustbin was the ultimate. I thought you'd have gone for two tone because it's Kenty, but no. No, no I let you off. Um, New no. only fish for wrongans 
mm. will never fish again. Oh, Roggins, bring them on. Take them on. Yeah, just leave them in the retainer for a few hours. Let them darken up. They'll be lovely. Come <laughs> on, the boy. No, yeah, they're, they're all, whatever floats your boat. So, yeah, I'll <clears> do that. I like that. Final question, night out on the bank or a night in with the missus? Night in with the missus because she's a legend and she lets me do whatever I want to do. And also, she's psychic and tells you when you're going to catch one. So if you yeah, were going to catch one, she'd tell you. She, she got it wrong last night. Did you get it wrong? But she, she, the, the, she thought it was a fish called the lady. Like she said, you're going to catch a fish called the lady. That's what you're catching. So when I'm there with Ash and I'm playing it and a big old mirror flops up and it's in, stuck in the weeds where I've had to chuck the chest waders on and wade out to get it. I was like, it's a big mirror, mate. It's like, it's the lady, it's the lady. It's going to be like £44 or for whatever it is, £42. I was like, a big mirror, a big one. Scooped it up, pulled it in. He went, ah, oh, it's orange spot. So then I texted her and said, oh, I've just caught a 40 pounder, but it's not the lady. But she has got it right many, many times in the past. I'll take that, mate. Yeah. My missus gets it right. She says you're going to catch an affle, and I genuinely catch an affle. <laughs> it's incredible, the regularity she's yeah, right. Yeah. No, nah, mate, you're an absolute legend. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Uh, I'll be back soon with another podcast. Until then, Ricky, mate, thank you so no, much. No, thank you. Out. It's been wicked.